Any fool with a dick can make a baby. But only a real man can record a podcast. Yeah, definitely true. Thank you, Griffin. I mean, they're, they're words to live by. I feel like podcasters overall as a breed are, are renowned for their maturity, right? <laughs> right, definitely. There is a, yes. a, a grave, solemn responsibility. Right, and it's so hard to do one. It's not like anyone can make a podcast. It's very, it's very, very difficult to do. You have to be so skilled. You have to, I mean, you have to do it with a very steady hand. You know, podcasts, they can't be indulgent. They can't be formless. They can't be overly long and rambling. You know, you really have to record a, a podcast with great caution and consideration. Thank you, uh, Furious Griff. Furious Griff. It is, I, I, did, I did not uh, put together that he, he started out his career with uh, uh, Furious Styles and then went too fast and too furious. He did go to later. That's true. Right. It's just nice that he, because he didn't get to direct the first Fast and Furious movie. Because he, he, he Furious is in his wheelhouse, right? That he gets to do a Fast and Furious movie. Right. Yes, absolutely. Because I imagine he, go, he goes in for the meeting on Too Fast and they go, we don't know. It might be tough for someone to just go straight to two without doing one. And he's like, no, no, no I did. I did one Furious. Right. Exactly. I can do two Furious. Who are we talking about, Griffin? We're talking about John Singleton, ladies. And gentlemen, one of the most prestigious directors in, in American history. I mean, he still is the youngest Academy Award nominee for Best Director ever. True. He also was nominated for Screenplay. And I guess uh, Nikki Reed beats him on that record. But otherwise, he must still That's be the second youngest, right? Funny. Oh, I didn't think about Of course, Nikki Reed. Remember that? Yeah, but, but there can't be anyone else younger than him who's nominated right for screenplay? i don't know maybe a child wrote a screenplay and won an oscar i don't know every nomination i'm sorry i did forget that green book was written by five men in a trench coat five little boys <laughs> right. stacked up yeah, on right. top of each other in a trench coat <laughs> trying to order a pizza and they accidentally wrote a screenplay hello i'm nick Wonga. i'm a grown-up Wait, why is she not? Why am I not? Did she? She didn't get nominated, Griffin. Nikki Reed not nominated. No, they never nominated 13 for screenplay. Okay, so then Singleton probably has the screenplay record as well, I'm guessing. Well, now I'm going to look it up, but keep talking. I was so certain that 13 got that nomination. Interesting. It didn't. It got shut out. Only Holly Hunter. Yeah. Um, John Singleton, the youngest man, the youngest director, period, ever nominated for uh, an Academy Award. Uh, the first African-American ever nominated for Best Director, uh, a massive blockbuster uh, success, uh, a cultural tidal wave, and it's his first movie. He's right out of film school. Uh, you know, David, it's been said that this is Blank Check, a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion products they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby. And a uh, few people represent that thesis more than this guy. Absolutely. He blank check out of the gate in a way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. And and that's why we've always talked about him. Not only had a blank check career wise, but kind of became a celebrity. You know? I do know. I'm furiously trying to figure out who is the the youngest um screenplay nominee ever. And I guess like the age of writers is less like public. Maybe that's why this is harder. But carry on, carry on. Yeah, The Age of Writers sounds like a like an eighth Transformers sequel. <laughs> a bad one. What's the name of this miniseries? We haven't decided. I'm realizing right now we have not decided. This is it a miniseries? See, I thought you would just have something. On the films of John Singleton, I didn't think about it. Obviously, we could call it two pod, two cast, but then it sounds like it's no. more of a Fast and Furious miniseries, which is disrespectful to the rest of the man's work. I think, but yeah, P Pod's in the cast. I, I mean, think. that's the obvious. The obvious is you yeah. do P-O-D-Z and the cast. Because most of his movies have one, two, you know, one, two words. They're, they're short, short titles. Right. And if we called it podcast, we'd have to put parentheses underneath it, uh, next to it, to make it clear if it was the 70s version, the 2000 version, or the 20... Do you get the joke? Right. Okay. Yeah, I do. So three keep Shaft keep movies going. all have the same title. The only dele delineation is the, the year. How about how about a uh, podetic just cast? No, 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 no. All right, no, no. takers. No. I just, I mean, Ben, I want you to think about 
how difficult it was for you to uh, say that right now. It rolled right off the tongue. I think it's called Pods in the Cast. I think that's what this is called. Mm -hmm. But I'm also going to introduce our guests and see if they have any alternating opinions. Uh, You know her as a co-host of Pop Culture Happy Hour on NPR and a great critic in her own right in various places. Uh, Folks, please welcome onto the show Aisha Harris. Hello, hello, hello. Pods in the cast. <laughs> we didn't think about this. I think it has to be, right? I Yeah, I mean, p- potty boy? Potty boy? I don't know. <laughs> potty boy is or funny. Potty boys. Potty, mm, potty boys. Boy. With a Z. But I might want to save that name for when I do my podcast about sitting on the potty. That's like my <laughs> own right. show I'm okay. going to do at some point. I have the answer. And okay. unsurprisingly, the answer is... John Singleton is the youngest nominee, but can you tell me the youngest winner in best screenplay? The youngest winner in best screenplay. Let me ask you, are they also a director? Uh, These days they are. But they weren't at the time. No, they're also best known as an actor. That was going to be my follow up question. It's Matt and Ben. Well, but which? Oh, Oh. Uh, Matt. They aren't identical twins. It's not Matt. It's Ben Affleck. Wow. He's the youngest winner of original screenplay. He was 25. Now, I have another uh, follow-up here. Uh, Joseph Mankiewicz is the youngest writing nominee ever. Younger okay. than Singleton, nominated mm. at the age of 22 for writing Skippy, the mm. Jackie Cooper movie, yes. in 1931. So he's the youngest ever. And Jackie Coogan is still the youngest acting nominee ever, right? Uh, look, Griffin, don't make me look up more, Taylor. I know he's young. Wasn't it Quavangene? Yeah, Quavangene's, you know, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, I think Cooper's the youngest lead acting, lead okay. actor, actor. He male, was maybe you know? the youngest male. The, the thing with Quavangene that's always interesting is that movie was like two years in post-production. So there's like the year that it was shot that age when it played at Sundance and when she got nominated is a three year span. She was nominated at age nine, much like Jackie Cooper. Uh huh. So it's a matter of months then. Right. Exactly. Yeah, she was, she was six. But I like that it was the other Mank that, uh, that is the actual youngest writer ever nominated. Hot Mank. We all saw Mank. There was, there was, you know, <laughs> there was regular Mank, and then there was Hot Mank. Yeah, yeah. One of them was hot. Do you think that was Fincher's <laughs> pitch to Netflix? Like when when they pitched the King Arthur reboot, <laughs> they were like, Ah, Mank. I don't know. And he's like, Don't worry, don't worry. There's a Hot Mank too. They're like, It's a big family. <laughs> Eventually, we'll wings. be able to do the movie about Ben Mankiewicz hosting at the movies. <laughs> Well, it's like two popes. It's like two manks. Yes. What, one yes. is hot. One is not. <laughs> right. But then, but then also it's like, it's also like the young pope. You know, it's like they were saying like, what if we could combine the two popes, the new pope and the young pope <laughs> with no popes? They're all manks. Yes. Affleck, the youngest winner. He was 25 years old. Who's the oldest winner? It just happened. The oldest winner was the King's Speech guy? No, it's James Ivory. He won when he was 89 freaking years old for oh. writing Call Me By Your Name. Remember? And he wore a t-shirt with Timothy Chalamet's face on it. I forgot that that won. It won. Yeah. Uh, It was his, it was his sort of career Oscar. He'd never won an Oscar. Yeah. That's wild. Pod's in the cast. Aisha's here. We're talking boys in the hood. We're talking John Singleton. Is there anything else we need to set up? Yeah. You, you, you have been a big uh, proponent of this film. Uh, Not that you're alone in that. But I feel like you've written about it in a lot of places. I've seen you tweet about it very often. You wrote the piece a couple of years ago of trying to establish the new black canon and wrote about how this movie needs to be like regularly discussed as one of the big directorial debuts of all time. Absolutely. Which it is. And I think to some degree, it's enduring success as like a mainstay of cable. You know, it's become one of those movies that people just watch over and over again on TV has diminished in people's minds how much of uh, a shockwave this was to come out of nowhere, you know, from a dude just out of film school. 
For sure. I mean, Cable was actually the first way that I saw this movie. Same here. And I didn't... <laughs> Every time I rewatch it now from the beginning to the end, I always forget about the first part of the movie, which is when they're kids. Yeah, when they're kids, when they're like, there's the first 30 minutes or so is, you know, Trey Styles as a young kid tearing it up in the uh, in class and then being sent to live with his his dad. And I always forget about that because for whatever reason, I always came into it on cable in the middle, like usually by the time they were all adults. And so, it, but, but it's 30 minutes. And then, and I, I really think those first 30 minutes are so crucial to setting the scene for, um, for the Furious Styles character, for the relationship, uh, between him and his mom. I just, I just think it's really, really great. But I do think that the the last third, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but the last third, third of the film is probably the best parts of the film. Like, it's the most consistently great. I, I will promise you we will get into the last third. I We're not going to not <laughs> talk about one third of this movie, yeah. Isn't there the whole thing where they shot it in sequence and he's like, yes. I'm literally a better director by the end of the movie? Yeah. like. I was learning as I went, essentially. And like, I, I, I feel like you can wa essentially watch me become a more confident filmmaker as the movie goes. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating in that regard. I mean, so rarely is a film shot in sequence and so rarely is someone's first film shot in sequence where you are seeing that arc of someone gaining uh, trust in their own storytelling skills, you know, as it goes on. Um, the, I, yeah, this is a good movie. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good movie. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I think I probably also first saw it on cable. My first memory of this movie, and this is slightly embarrassing, but we were talking Oscars, is um, that in the mid 90s, I'm sh you may or may not remember, there was, I must have been like nine years old and watching the Oscars. Christopher Reeve comes out. He'd recently been injured. He's in mm -hmm. his wheelchair and he's, you know, everyone gives him a big ovation. And my parents just sort of explained to me, like, oh, this is who this is, and here's why this is, you know, like they're trying to lay out the information. And he's like, he gives the classic cornball kind of like, the, you know, the, the Hollywood is so good, and they make movies about, you know, socially relevant things. And they, he's introducing a montage. Do either of you remember this? Vaguely. I would have been too young. Yeah, <laughs> right. Point. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I definitely didn't watch it live. I've almost definitely watched it on YouTube in the last five years. They play a montage, and I'm sure if I saw this montage as a grown-up, I tried to find it, but all those montages are, like, you know, scrubbed from the internet. Like, I'm sure if I watch it now, I'd be like, oh, this is the usual sort of Oscar cornball crap. But when I was nine, it blew me away, and it has Ricky getting shot in it. And, like, Ricky! You know, like, that's in it. And I had never seen Boys from the Hood, and I was like, that looks like the craziest movie. Like, like I was just like, that movie looks like it shouldn't, like exist it's so extreme i was like so my mind was so blown by it and i have never forgotten it and every time i watch boys in the hood i'm i mean obviously it's an iconic scene but that that was my first introduction D did christopher reeve offer a spoiler warning i was gonna say spoiler <laughs> spoiler <Yeah>. alert <laughs> that's crazy. It, was, it was shocking i think that's why i was so shocked i was like is that like at the end of the movie i don't i don't know i just remember it blowing my mind that's a Clark Kent s goof up. That's not Superman behavior. Clark <laughs> Kent spoils a movie for you by accident. It is. It is also. I was texting with Richard Lawson today because he watches the you know ceremonies for Vanity Fair every year, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Do you remember this?" And he's like, "Yes." And he's like, "Why did Christopher Reeve?" <laughs> and it's like, "I'm Christopher Reeve. Obviously, I've been through this terrible thing. Luckily, yeah. the Oscars make movies like <laughs> Philadelphia and Boys in the Hood. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's sure." It's so funny when you say that, though, because it's like the two of you, Aisha, David, you, you write and speak about movies for a living. And, and I work in this stuff and make more of a living speaking about it now and all this stuff. And now I feel like when they trawl out one of those like montages, I'm like, oh, get the fuck over no, yourself. No, montages are the best. They're my favorite part. <laughs> I want to make this clear. I love the montages. I love the montages. What, a back patty montage can be a bit much, but I do love a montage. What I tend to roll my eyes at are the speeches before the montage. The exact mm. Christopher Reeve thing of like, you don't understand. This is important. The montage <laughs> itself, I'm always down for. When they do the back patty uh, intro, it always makes me like roll my eyes a little bit. 
But when I was like fucking six, I would go like, yeah, movies are the most important things in the world. Like right. the, the <laughs> intros would make me tear up and I'd be like, this is like four score and seven years ago. People are going to be remembering this speech <laughs> for the rest of time. Movies make a difference. This is the power of cinema. <laughs> oh, I, like, loved, I yeah. love the power of cinema, guys. <laughs> Look, we love movies. And I think I also probably did not see this movie in full for, for years because I probably only was seeing it on TV. Yeah. And it's like that. I've also only seen like the first 20 minutes of like Hook once. Yeah. You know, I only watched that shit on cable. It's a long movie. Such a long movie. But it's so good. <laughs> I watched I watched it recently and I forgot there's like a half hour of him as a, you know, as a grown up before he gets to Neverland. Oh, the best part of the movie. No, Rufio forever. Well, Rufio is really good. Look, we can't get into Hook <laughs> right now. Into Aisha, Hook. You have to come back for Hook when we eventually do Hook because gladly, clearly there's gladly. just a lot to litigate. Yes. Yeah. Can I introduce a new term? I've thought about this in my head a couple of times, but I feel like I want to I want to make it officially part of our lexicon for for movies like this, because I also had seen this on cable over the years, but uh, out of order, piecemeal. And then I like kind of constructed it in my head watching it tonight. I realized I think this is the first time I properly sat down and just watched this movie from beginning to end with complete intentionality. I think that form of watching a movie it, we should call it the Cloverfield monster. Because mm, you only see bits and you pieces. You never see the whole thing at one time. It's like the, the parable of the elephant or whatever. Everyone right, in your play. head, you're like, I've seen the whole thing. I, put, I can put it together. But so I had, I had Cloverfield monstered this. Uh, but, but yeah, it wasn't until I started watching this, and especially that, that opening 30 minutes, that I was like, oh, I've never really given this movie the the full respect it deserves a fully focused viewing not just flipping between a couple channels or jumping in late oh wow i, I actually the last time i saw it before re-watching it <clears throat> for this podcast i saw it last in 2016 i think in on on the big screen and john singleton was uh he was there he did a q a afterwards it was fantastic damn it was like ooh, glad i got to get that in before unfortunately he passed so yeah, it is also bizarre that he only died uh, two years ago. Like he yeah. obviously died way too young, but something about how long 2020 was makes it feel like he died five years ago. Yeah. When I looked up the date and was like that was 18 months ago, it kind of blew my mind. Yeah, it was so weird when he died, but it was also so I mean, the arc of his career is so strange in that when he sort of stops making movies, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I know he was still working on stuff. Yeah. And obviously he was working in television. He was sort of talking about like, oh, you know, I'm working on a new movie, et cetera. But like, it was like, oh, well, yeah, sure. John Singleton, he's been making movies forever. And it's like, no, he was not that old. Yeah, he's 51. But, you know. Yeah. Of course not when he died, but also just when he stopped making movies. Uh, when He's not that old when abduction comes out. He's the age that many people might start in the industry. So, you know what I mean? And 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 there's six years between abduction and four brothers, you know, I mean, right. It's profound how big a career he had, considering how early we lost him and, you know, just sort of the, you know, the up and downs of his career, like, you know, that by the end, he was more just doing like genre films like uh, after the earlier part. Right. Yeah. I was watching this thing on the the 4K uh, steel book. Uh, which I guess was for some anniversary. It might have been released around the time when you saw the screening. Was it was it an anniversary thing? Was it like a 25th or something? Yeah, it would have been 2016. So that would have been the 25th anniversary. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this was released around that time. And they have a really good retrospective feature where everyone was interviewed, where they get Cuba and Cube and Neil Long and Morris Chestnut and uh, and John Singleton. They're all speaking really can't Regina King. Uh, I mean, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, obviously this was like such a launching pad for so many careers. careers. Absolutely. Right. And they're all sort of talking like 25 years later, the perspective they have of how much they didn't realize what the movie was going to be at the time and how much they couldn't process the success because it was such a whirlwind, all that sort of stuff. But Singleton said in it, which I'm guessing was recorded around 2015 or 2016, like when I was young and I had this prodigious success. And everyone viewed me as like, you know, oh, you're no tour. You're you're the young black Orson Welles. Right. 
this is what you're going to do. You're going to make important issues movies that he kind of resented that because his dream of his career was to have like some sort of Howard Hawksy, very varied. I can do every genre. I can experiment in a bunch of different things. And then you look at his career and it's like he makes like the four complete blank check movies, right? Like he makes Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, Higher Learning, Rosewood are the like, I have a real story to tell. He's fitting into the industry's perception of what a John Singleton movie is. And then it feels like he almost strategically is like, I need to do big blockbusters, you know? It's funny, like outside of Baby Boy is the outlier. And then in TV, he starts to get back to like more dramatic roots, but that I think he really wanted to show people that he could do different types of things. And to a certain degree, he then got stuck in it, you know? I guess, I mean, he's also, he's the start of that 90s generation of filmmakers who came up on Spielberg and, you know, Star Wars and blockbusters and like, you know, that, 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 I mean, the other guys are going to come a little later because he started so young, but like M. Night Shyamalan or I'm trying to think of like the sort of big 90s breakout directors. Well, Tarantino, I mean, fits into this. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, Tarantino, I'm trying, come on, help me out here, Griffin. Who are, who are hot 90s directors? My brain is fried. Brad Silberling, director of Casper. I mean, if we're talking mm. like the canonical director of the 90s. The Wachowskis. Wachowskis, sure. Wachowskis, yeah. Baz Luhrmann, um, Robert Rodriguez, you know, people like that where it's like... Levinson, yeah. Yeah, and they're like, you know, they, they came of age with with the, the, the you know, the, the opening weekend big blockbuster. Like, you know, but you know, there's no generation before that that would have had that in the rearview mirror, if that makes sense. I, I think there's another part to this, too, which is Orson Welles. It was so legendary that he was this boy wonder that he hit so big so early, but then kind of could never climb out of the shadow of that original success. Right. Kane haunts him for the rest of his career. He can never match it again. Well, and, and Mank, he had Mank on his tail. Well, old man. Yes, but that's right. We'll cover that story when the adventures, the new adventures of old man comes out. That's that's Netflix 2025. (laughs) But Spielberg does offer this new model of like, here's a kid who snuck onto the lot, was directing Night Gallery when he was 20 and was the biggest director in the world by the age of 25. Right. So those people you're talking about, M. Night and Singleton and Wachowskis and whatever, I think are really looking to the Spielberg thing of like, oh, you can kind of make yourself that quickly. You can be filled with vim and vinegar and just like march into the studios to tell them I'm ready to make a movie. And you might be able to will Fincher. Yes. You know, you also can't discount, you know, him singleton coming out of the L.A. film movement and the L.A. rebellion. So he had yes, he had Spielberg, but then he also had all of these black artists from the 70s and 80s who were making films that had a message in the same way that he did. Charles Burnett, you know, um, all these Gordon filmmakers, Parks. Gordon Parks. Uh, so he definitely kind of borrows from both of those. And then, of course, you can't really talk about John Singleton without talking about Spike Lee and how something like Do the Right Thing opens the door for him two years later to to do that. That's the thing that's so wild, right? Like the, 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 you sort of forget that just in the context of these few years that like, when Do the Right Things com- comes out, like major studios are like, well, we don't make political movies anymore, essentially. Right. Like, and like Do the Right Thing is them being like, oh, is there a sea change? Like, you know, it's he says it. I, I feel like in every interview I've ever read with him where he's like, the, you know, Boys in the Hood gets made because Do the Right Thing had hit so big. Yeah. Like that, that that had sort of changed everything. When there's such fundamentally different movies. But but it was that thing. I mean, it's like when you hear about um you know, like the post Easy Rider revolution in Hollywood, where they were like, oh, my God, kids like these movies that are angry and political. And suddenly the bean counters were like, I don't know, hire angry young people. Let them make <laughs> movies, you know, <laughs> until it wore out. And it felt like after Do the Right Thing, they're just like, oh, well, I, I guess like the African-American audience has something to say, like fine filmmakers who have something to say. Yeah, it's 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 like a blessing and a curse because it's great that that opened the door for him. But then. They all get lumped in together under like, quote unquote, hood movies. I mean, not so much Spike Lee, but then what Boys in the Hood obviously births is like, then you have the Hughes brothers and Menace to Society and like, um, I'm trying to think of the other sort of quintessential 90s. Well, there's like Dead Dead Presidents. Yeah. Right. Dead Presidents. Dead Presidents is really, is such a good movie. Well, Juice is fantastic. I love Juice. Juice is good. I mean, the thing is, these movies are great, but it is... It's it's just how Hollywood always moves, right? They yeah. always just like move as a sort of like, 
oh, let's copy them or let's do more of this. Right. You know, and then, yeah, as you say, everyone just kind of gets swept into one bucket. And then it's like, well, do you have a message for us? And what if a filmmaker's like, no, I don't want, that's not what I was looking to do. You know, but I just want to make house party. Come on. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) But I I think you see, like, if you're Reginald Hudlin, you start with house party. You're like, can I be taken a little more seriously? If you're John Singleton, you start with Boys in the Hood. You're like, can you let me make a Fast and Furious movie? You know, I think there's this, like, rebellious attitude of, like, let me make something that doesn't have any larger point behind it. This this sounds like a uh, Malcolm and Marie. Have you have you seen I, that movie yet? <laughs> oh my god! We we don't need to get into it, but you know, <laughs> no. Let's let's get into it for five seconds. Did you like Malcolm and Marie? What, what did you think of that movie that I had to watch this week? Ooh, I did not like that movie. Um, <laughs> no, it's not very good. <laughs> it's not very good. And the thing about it is, you know, and I I've, I'm reviewing it for NPR, and we also have a episode on it. But you know, my fi- my whole thing is. A lot of what is happening in that movie by Sam Levinson, who is Barry Levinson's son. Sure is. uh, What's happening in that movie is them like they're saying true things like, yes, all of these black filmmakers even today still get pigeonholed. You know, Ava DuVernay has talked about how every time she's interviewed, no one wants to talk about the actual craft of her work. And what goes into the technical aspects, everyone's like just talking about the message and she wants to be taken seriously both for her message and for her art. Um, so all that is true. But then when you have it being spouted in the <laughs> most hackneyed, <laughs> ham-fisted way, yelled, cussing, all this. And ugh. and in between, they're like, anyway, like, what the fuck is up with our sex life? They scream <laughs> about that. I mean, but yes, it is essentially Sam Levinson is making a movie about how it's hard to be a black director in like modern Hollywood. So weird with with Den- Denzel Washington's kid. Uh, it's just weird. <laughs> yes, yes. It looks nice. Looks very nice. Yeah, they're both beautiful, and the house is beautiful. Very. They they look great. The house is cool. I also I'll say philosophically, that's kind of the only sort of movie I feel like should be getting made in the midst of a pandemic. Well, yes, <laughs> right. Like that sounds like a safe production. I don't know if that's a huge recommendation for <laughs> the viewing experience. You, you'll feel but. you'll feel ethical while while watching it. You won't you won't feel bad. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you could honestly put it on mute. Yeah. Maybe put some music over the back or just any music you like, and like have a good time because they are these two very striking, very good looking, on you know good actors walking around, and you know the photography is very crisp. Maybe maybe that's the approach with Malcolm and Marie. I've heard someone who actually did that. They like they turned off the sound halfway through and were just like, all right, you know. I'm going to put on an LP. I don't know. <laughs> they can just sort of play out in the background. Can I throw out a theory? Something I was thinking on during this. This whole generation of, of 90s African-American directors that we're talking about, right? Like Singleton and the Hughes brothers, you know, Spike Lee entering the second decade of his career. Ernest Dickerson starting to direct these things himself. And you also have like Robert Townsend. I mean, right. I know he starts in the late 80s, but like guys like that, you know, he was still directing in the yeah. 90s. But yeah, 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 he was. He absolutely was. He just started a little earlier. But yeah, I, yeah. I think all of them, if we're talking about, you know, these guys getting pigeonholed, right, and feeling limited in the perception of, of the societal weight and responsibility their movies need to hold. I think these guys all kind of get fucked by Don't Be a Menace, too. I think Don't Be yeah. a Menace just kind of flattens all of these films out into feeling like. <laughs> Oh, it's a genre with cliches now. And even though I think it's an affectionate parody, it makes people feel like, oh, are these movies mechanical? And then after that, almost all of these directors are like, "Uh, I'm making something different. I'm doing From Hell. I'm doing Too Fast, Too Furious. You know, I'm doing the Italian job. Like all of them shift to like, I'm not making inner city issue character based movies anymore. So you're saying the Waynes brothers screwed (laughs) all these filmmakers or suggesting? (laughs) I think there's an argument. I feel like we talk about this a lot, but sometimes like parodies can really fuck things over. Absolutely. I mean, speaking of the Waynes brothers, I think Scary Movie killed the slasher, the slasher revival, right? Like, yeah, when, when you point out the 
ground rules for a genre, yeah, it can sort of hurt the genre. The, the problem is that then the dumbest audience member feels like they're smarter than the movie, right? They're like, well, I saw someone explain to me the thing that happens in all of these movies. Right. Uh, so now I feel like I'm ahead of the eight ball. You can't you can't get me anymore. But I, yeah, like Scary Movie comes out in 2000 and Saw comes out in 2004. You know, and in between those two, uh, the big hit. In between is the, is the J horror boom. There's that like there's that. Year That's J a good call. Boom. That's yeah. a good call. Yeah. Yeah, but then the problem is, Scary Movie Three just just fucking takes them to task. <laughs> scary Movie I Three don't remember eviscerates scary movie three. J horror. I don't remember that. I don't want to talk about it. I don't. I don't either. Savage. <laughs> Scary Movie 3, of course, is based on uh, two of the biggest uh, horror movies of the early 2000s. Uh, three, three. Its main uh, uh, parody uh, targets are uh, Signs, uh, The Ring, and The Matrix Reloaded. You know, the three biggest <laughs> scary movies. I think 8 Mile got taken down, too. Yes, yes, that's the fourth oh, yeah, one. Yeah, yes, right. yes. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, scary Movie 5, of course, uh, just uh, brutally eviscerates uh, Brokeback Mountain, the scariest movie of the mid 2000s. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about a real scary movie. Like if I if I were to make a scary movie six today, the main subject would be not being able to get better help. That's what I would say. That's that's the subject. And in fact, it would be inappropriate because it wouldn't be funny it wouldn't fit into a funny parody movie it would be an actual scary movie not being able to get better help because this is an ad read for better help i snuck one in there folks is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals this is where they say host inserts personal experience this is where i once again say like a global pandemic you don't need a better excuse than that better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And you can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. And there is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. That's one of the big pluses to better help is that this service is available for clients worldwide. And especially in this year, you know, we're coming out of lockdown, but you still might not feel comfortable going to see someone in person. Who knows how close the most qualified person is? With BetterHelp, you can log into your account anytime, send a message to your counselor, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. And uh, here are some examples of people who are living happier lives today. This person said, I love Linda. That's a review on the BetterHelp website. Sounds like they're living a happier life. How about this one? I've had anxiety since I was 11. Can't relate. Never got the help that I needed. I also went through a really dark time where I shut everyone else out. Can't relate. I want nothing to do with talking to anybody about my anxiety. Can't relate. And then I made the decision to get help. And I started talking with Barry a few months ago, and he has helped me overcome so many things in my life. I don't know where I would be without his help. And I'll just add a quick little edit to that. This review, they should have said, I don't know where I would be without his better help. Visit BetterHelp.com slash check. That's Better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp, they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 nifty United States. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And once again, Blank Check listeners can get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp dot com slash check john singleton griffin born in la grew up in la right um i think his childhood he said is like he he at some point goes to live with his dad right that that is the thing that he's borrowing from his childhood for this movie that his mom yes 
sends him to live with his dad. Right. His mother is a, a pharmaceutical company sales executive. His father is a real estate agent, more a mortgage broker, financial planner, very ser- uh, similar to Fury Styles. Yeah. Of Harvard, I know he goes to USC. He's part of that group that's emerging in the early 90s. But the only other thing, I mean, like I know he, like I'm saying, like I know he says he loves Star Wars. He loved Spielberg movies. He loved stuff like that. I mean, he, but I think the comic books and video games that he used all that stuff as an escape growing up. But that when he went to college, he wasn't intending to be a filmmaker. He went originally, I think, for computer science. And then, right, took a film writing class and then fell deeply into it. Margaret Maring, who, like, basically, like, uh, mentored him into uh, making movies. This is his, like, thesis movie, practically. I mean, he's so dang young. Right. When he wanted to apply to get into the program, you had to write three, like, sample projects that you would like to make one day. And this is one of those three movies. And I mean, I just I read this interview with him where he's like, I mean, it's it's a John Hughes movie. Like, that's what that was what I had grown up with as a teenager is like, there's so much of that. You know, obviously stand by me as well. Them going to see mm-hmm. the dead body. Right. You know, early in the movie. But he says, like, there's so much just coming of age stuff that I'm pouring into that movie like that, that he's just sort of thinking of this as his John Hughes movie. This was the thing on, on the application for the, the film program you had to write down three ideas for films. And this one was called Summer of 84. And I think it was more spiraling out of just the seeing a dead body as children thing. It was the Stand By Me thing. And then as it expanded, it turned into more of a a wide-ranging life of these young men rather than just the childhood. He sells the script and he's like, I have to direct it. And like, I don't know. I mean, I think there's just this sort of confluence of things happening post do the right thing where a studio is like, okay, give it a shot. I like, I, it's crazy to think, I know the movie was inexpensive. Like it costs like $6 million to make, but still that, that Columbia was just like, yes, you can, you know, you can, you know, have, have cat, you know, go for it. You, he doesn't even have a huge star attached to it. Really. I know ice cube is obviously a big figure, but they barely, apparently he's like singleton's like, they barely know who he was. Um, I want to get this woman's name so I can give her proper credit. But on that sort of retrospective uh, special feature I was watching, there was an executive at Columbia who grew up in South L.A. who is African-American, who really feels like much like, uh, you know, all the female directors we have covered on this podcast, how the way they got their movie made was there was one female executive who read their script and fought it through the system. Uh, This woman feels like she was very much the champion for John Singleton, you know, that he was this sort of hot thing out of film school uh, that that he had his his teacher mentor presenting him around town. And the other thing I've heard uh, reading interviews and stories about him, especially looking back at pieces from when he passed, when people were writing about their experiences with him, that he was just by all accounts, this preternaturally uh, uh, confident guy. That at the age of 22, he just walked in and was so self-assured, so confident, not cocky, you know, but really could uh, put a studio executive at ease and feel like this person's mature enough to direct a movie. Um, but let me find the name of this executive because she deserves a lot of credit, I think, as well for, for getting him through Columbia. Shout out to the single female executives. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I just interviewed Shaka King um, to talk about Judas and the Black Messiah. And he was like, look, this movie essentially only got made because there was one executive at Warner Brothers who wanted to make a movie like this. And every other studio I went to, there was not one person, you know, who was that interested. Like, it, it, it is sort of depressing how often it just boils down to like, yeah, there was just one exec. Right. Like, like, Nor Efron only gets to direct movies because of... Uh... Linda Obst, you know, it's like there's there's always that sort of like story when it's not a straight white male uh, going through the studio system. Uh, I'm still trying to find this woman's name uh, embarrassingly. But she also pointed out like she was talking about how surprising it was to all of them that it got the two Oscar nominations. And they were just like, we just Never conceived, even when the film had played at Cannes, even when it was a big hit, when it was critically adored, that it was ever going to break through there because it was like Spike didn't get nominated. These movies 
never get nominated. And then she said, I didn't get invited to the Oscars until a year ago. Mm. I mean, I, I wonder if Spike not getting nominated is part of. I mean, we, we can always spec- speculate about why these things, ha- how these things shake out. No, but, I think that's a good read. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just because I remember, I, well, I wasn't, <laughs> I was a child when uh, that happened, but I know that it was kind of an outrage that he didn't get nominated for director or screenplay. Or no, he was for screenplay. He, he was nominated for screenplay. Yeah, but not He director, was nominated for screenplay, not, not for director. But, and, and, but, and then the compounding thing of that, that's the year that the Best Picture winner is Driving Miss Daisy. Which yeah. is sort of a dead on arrival movie in terms of uh, cultural cachet. Like it's not like that movie didn't become a butt of jokes. Like that, like that movie winning Best Picture was very quickly something that everyone rolled their eyes at. Like so, it was like Green Book. <laughs> it really was. It's so crazy that Green Book won Best Picture. I think about it all the time. I don't know if I'm ever gonna get over it. I think about it a lot. There's like 2016 and then there's Green Book and they're both like, I still can't believe this happened. I mean, I can, but I can't. <laughs> it, it, that's exactly it. The fact that Green Book is sandwiched in and like where like you've got um, uh, Spotlight, Moonlight, Shape of Water, Green Book, Parasite. Yes, Spotlight is a fairly that's the most traditional of those movies. So it's, it's a good movie, though. It's Shape of Water is like the next most obvious winner in, in that bunch like and that's you know object you know it's a still a strange genre monster movie and then green book is just the oscars being like come on give us one year to, to do some <laughs> bullshit come on please uh St- stephanie allen a-l-l-a-i-n oh, stephanie allen. oh yes, yes who's course. a major yes. deal uh that's why i was beating myself up for not remembering her name she is a, a major deal absolutely yes <clears throat> yeah i'm mad i didn't remember that myself Yes, uh, but that's what she was talking about. I mean, this was an early film for her being an executive. She transitioned to being a producer and still, you know, uh, didn't get invited into the Academy Awards until 25 years later. And she was like, it's kind of astonishing in that sense that they recognize this movie in its moment. But I think I think that was a big part of it. If I could just circle back to Green Book for a second. I, I remember when because it was Julia Roberts announced it, right? Yes. And she just goes, Green Book. Right. And I just I like I laughed. I wasn't even outraged. Yeah. I was like the gall of these fuckers. It is so bananas that they did this. I mean, it, it was it was a white lash. It was making up for Moonlight <laughs> in the same way. No, it absolutely was. And 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 in general, making up for the the push to, you know, ex- diversify and expand the membership. Yeah. It was this. The, it was absolutely a backlash from older voters and maybe younger because like the whole buzz that year, because people just kept asking the reporters, like, why is Green Book doing so well? Is that, oh, well, I, you know, I talked to voters and they're like, well, I liked that movie. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Maybe you enjoyed Green Book, but th- that that's a, still kind of a walk to like best picture of the year. Mark it down. <laughs> it is such a fucking slight movie. That is what makes it so absurd above all else is it's not even like an offensive movie of mock profundity. You know, it's a movie where a guy folds an entire pizza pie and eats it on a bed. Well, I also remember just being there was like this weird, I don't know how long it was, maybe 45 minute moment where a Ferrelli brother had an Oscar and Spike Lee did it. And I was like, how is this? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, that was the same year. <laughs> well, right. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Spike saying it's not my cup of tea. The greatest. Right? And that was that the was greatest. that was a good Oscar season because it was also the Lady Gaga Bradley Cooper Oscar. But it was, that was a very... you have Black Panther and Black Klansman nominated for Best Picture, right? It felt like such a mirror. And Bohemian Rhapsody, right? And Green Book, but it felt like such a mirroring of the Driving Miss Daisy, Do the Right Thing. Yeah, right. Sure. Where Spike's just sitting there, like just going, like I'm, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> but really, this again in a car, light, oh, yeah. gentle comedy for old people. Really? <sighs> Sorry. Anyway. Sorry for bringing up Green Book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I agree. I just want to add onto your list, Aisha. It's, it's <laughs> getting elected, the pandemic, and Green Book are the three <laughs> things I play in my mind over and over again. I was just like, how did we let this such a perfect storm of things leading up to that moment? We should have stopped it. Uh, it's OK. Uh, we're, 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 we're all doing fine. Yes. Um, boys in the hood. Boys in the hood. Um, so he makes this movie. I mean, I 
the only thing from the production that I really know about is what I'm, you know, the, the fact that it was shot in sequence, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that like Cuba Gooding Jr. Mars Chestnut, he's like casting them as they walk in the door. Like they're not known entities at all. Right. They were the first two actors who showed up. Uh, Ice Cube, he had worked on the Arsenio Hall show. Is that correct? And he met him there. Yeah, he was like a an, an intern at the Arsenio Hall show. That's the thing. I mean, he was a PA on Pee Wee's Playhouse, and that's where he met Lawrence right. Fishburne and handed him the script. Like half of the cast is constructed, not half, but a portion of the cast. In a way, the biggest names were gotten through him having the confidence as a PA to pull aside a star and say, will you take a look at this? Angela Bassett is like brand new to movies. I guess she's That's done some TV. What's wild. She's done a lot of TV at this point, but this is pretty much her first substantive movie role. And she's only done like two or three movies, period, before this and, and very, very small. Yeah, this was two years before What's Love Got to Do With It, I think. Yeah. 93 yeah. or 92. One or two years. Yeah. Yeah. It's two years. No, you're right. It's two years. And it's funny to think that, right, that that's, that's her and, and Lawrence Fishburne again. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, because that, that weirdly feels, what's love got to do with it feels like 10 years after this. Yeah. Just in terms of how they're playing. I, I don't know. They're, I guess they're just, they just seem older, I guess. I don't know how. It but, also um, feels to me yeah. like Angela Bassett was so dominant in the 90s. It's hard to process that she wasn't really in movies until 1991. You want to be right. like, wasn't she a star for eight years before this movie came out? Wasn't she the one lending her credibility to get it bankrolled? And she's like, no, this was like the first time someone really took a shot on me and let me play a big part in a film. Mm -hmm. This is also like basically the last Larry Fishburne movie. The deep cover is the actual last one, but that's it. Right, because he's still like, I mean, obviously he started young and he's in Apocalypse Now and stuff. But at the point this movie comes out, he has been most prominent in Pee Wee's Playhouse for the couple of years <laughs> leading up to this. Where he's Larry Fishburne. Does a lot of, you know, Coppola movies. He's in School Days, yeah. which he's, he's great in. He's so hot in this movie. Is that, oh. I'm sorry, I made him my background. Yeah. <laughs> I see. He, <laughs> he's just so fucking good in this movie. He is like so is. captivating. It is astonishing he didn't get nominated. Yeah. I, mm, yeah. He's, the, the scene with him and when, he embraces Trey and Trey's just crying. I just, ugh. every, every time I, I just tear up a little bit because it's just such a great moment. That seems so good. And the scene where he takes Trey and Ricky to Compton. Okay. Can we talk about that scene? Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> because I was watching it obviously for the, I don't know how many times at this point. And it struck me that while I love this movie, I do think sometimes it feels a little PSA after school special. It has that like that sort of Stanley Kramer movie thing, yeah. like, like a you know, like a like a this is an issues movie, and we're going to talk about this now, right? And and I obviously like I think there there are merits to that, and I and I you know don't I still love this movie, but it was interesting to me because I noticed for the first time that they get to Compton. And they're standing there and he's talking to them. And like, as soon as they he, they stand in front of that billboard, people just start milling over. Yes. <laughs> yes. Felt, felt, right. like, hey, what's going like on a, over here? Someone talking? <laughs> yes. And it was, <laughs> I was just like, oh, this feels like a play. I feel like I'm in a high school play. <laughs> this is why I brought that scene up, though, is like that scene should be a disaster, right? That scene is like the movie <laughs> becoming so didactic in terms of what it's trying to say. Yeah. And really like grabbing the lapels of the audience members and saying, listen, and it only works because of Lawrence Fishburne. The oh, fact yeah. that he pulls that scene off, he is so just quietly powerful that you do believe that people would just wander towards him the second he stands in front of a billboard. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I still think it works. It's just I noticed it this time and I was like, yes, Ooh, this is. It never crossed my mind. I was <laughs> like, yeah, you go listen to Larry Fishburne talk like that's what you do. But here's the thing. He hadn't even started talking. He, they literally just stood there and then they came over. <laughs> Come on. Aisha, if you saw that guy walking down the street, you'd be like, holy shit. Let me follow this guy. I, I want to see what's going to happen in his day. Yes. And again, Lawrence Fishburne was hot. And so is yeah. Morris, so is Morris Chestnut. No. Oh, Morris Chestnut's hot. <laughs> well, Mar Morris Chestnut is beautiful. Yes. Morris yes. Chestnut yes. is just a yes. beautiful person. Yes. Because, I mean, he's, he's hot, but like, because he's like, whatever he is, 50-ish now. And I mean... He looks 
older in that like yeah, but he's he's aged like wine yeah mm-hmm. it, i don't know if you folks had this thing too but like Morris Chestnut is one of those people who looks like he was designed to be bald. Like, he just has a perfectly shaped head. He's, like, ideally bald. He's a good-looking bald man. Right. There's no question. In the same way as, like, Michael Jordan, where it's like, yes, yes this makes sense. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and when you see footage in, like, Last Dance of Young Michael Jordan with hair, you're like, the geometry of this is wrong. <laughs> There's something about... Morris Chestnut having all that extra hair height as Ricky. I'm like, dude, you're good looking. Get rid of the hair. You don't need it. <laughs> I like him in either form. Doesn't matter to me. Hey, look, I'll take I'll take a piece of Morris Chestnut anywhere I can get it. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at sort of yeah. He, I guess he has age. He's gotten. I don't know. It's just his eyes. I guess you you know you age in the eyes. That's how, but he really when he was in that show. What the hell was it called? It was called like uh, oh that on like CB not CBS but like I I know what you're talking about. It was on Fox. It was I was saying like surely it wasn't called Rosewood because that's a movie John Singleton made. It was called Rosewood. He played Dr. Rosewood. And I just remember the, 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 the poster for that show was just like, look, it's Mars Chestnut. He's got like sunglasses on. You, wait, you don't want to watch this? <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> I was like, I was like, come on. I'm like, what does he do? They're like, I don't know. He's a doctor or something. You got more questions? David, you're making me realize that should be the tagline for every TV show. Just you want to watch this? <laughs> Come on, you're like, come on. You see this? This is what the show is. This is when it starts airing. You want to watch it? Give it a, give it a consideration. He's got a jacket or something. Give it a, he's got a jacket. <laughs> I do love that, especially with certain people like Rob Lowe having a new TV show every fucking season. You're like, this time he's he's got glasses. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Rob Lowe, but mustache. We've added a mustache. Are you, yeah. are you, are you interested? This time, no tie. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, anyway, Morris Chestnut, very, very, very hot. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the other thing. It's just everyone in this movie goes on to pop because of this. You know, everyone. I mean, the, what, the eight principal actors? Apart from Ice Cube, I guess. Right. Yeah. Apart from Ice Cube? No, I'm saying Ice Cube has. He's already popped. I mean. But not as a, a movie star. Not as a movie star. It's his first movie role. And he it's true. He goes right on to make a bunch more movies. And Friday is four years from now. He gets to write a movie. Yes, he continued to be a movie star for decades. I mean, I just think he he has had the most durable acting career of any rapper turned actor, probably. Right. Uh, does Will Smith count as a rapper? Interesting. Yes. OK. <laughs> yes. Does, yes. Does he count? He counts. Mm, he counts. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, summer summertime still slaps. So yeah, there's that. Summertime does slap. I'm trying. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm just trying to remember the exact trajectory of like when does you know parents don't just understand, but it's coming out before. Yeah, it's a few years before the Fresh Prince. So yeah, yeah. Will Smith counts. I I just think Cube's career is not often given the respect for how persistent it has been. You know, if you just look at the range of how much he's pretty much stayed a very reliable presence in movies for almost three decades in different sized roles in different genres. Yeah. And he went into the, the kitty the family movie, you know, with Are You There Yet? Are We There Yet? Yeah. I, I like when Ice Cube is mad. He's very funny when he's mad. It's right. like, yes. it's, he's so good at that. That's his 2010s. It's the sneer, right? The yes. sneer is what made him a star. I think that's what Singleton recognized was just, you put this sneer on a big screen, it's going to work. I don't know if the guy technically knows how to act yet, but the dude's got presence and that sneer is worth like a million dollars. He's honestly fantastic in this movie. I mean, but that's not crazy, right? No. Like, he's just good in this movie. It's kind of the movie star thing where it's, or whatever, where he's just like, Seems very comfortable in front of the camera. John Singleton had a great eye. He recognized that that guy is just fucking compelling to watch. I just do think it's interesting if you look at all the different... Because I think anytime he shows up in a movie, people are still kind of like, Ice Cube in a movie, you know? (laughs) Because like Ice Cube as a celebrity, as an idea, is so much bigger than any part he plays. But then you're like... That's how he's... Right. That's like 21 Jump Street. Like, then it's true. It can be like 25 years into his career as a film actor. Tony on Drum Street is like, isn't it funny that Ice Cube is the boss? Right. Like, and you're like, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're like, this guy's really proven himself. He can play the boss in a comedy. You know, he can do two fucking family movies. 
You know, he could be the lead in a triple X sequel. He's sort of soft retired right now, I would say. I know. Well, now he's just on Twitter getting uh, getting people upset. So there's that. (laughs) That's the thing. He's getting people upset on Twitter. He also, of course, founded the big three to which I, I go to the finals every year. Because you can get courtside seats for like $40. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, We're not thinking of Ice-T. Ice-T has been pretty persistent as an actor as well. Well, Ice-T just got that one job and held on to it. Well, yeah, life. but I mean... <laughs> he, he went to SVU. It doesn't count. <laughs> but I'm just saying, he's not really... He's not really... Yeah, he's not challenging himself with new roles No, anymore, he, he built right? a Ice-T really just, nice nest yeah. for himself. Yes. I just... Every <laughs> single time... I get a like five dollar residual check for the one scene of one episode of Law and Order I was on eight years ago. I just try to do the math on what Ice T must be getting in the mail on a daily basis. <laughs> so much. It just boggles the mind. Yeah. I, I actually saw them one time in Grand Central very early in the morning shooting a scene between Ice T and uh, Richard Belzer. That was that was a fun New York City sighting. The bells. <laughs> have have I ever told this story on Mike very briefly? I don't know because I don't know what you're about to say, but I <laughs> doubt it. My my one scene on SVU is me playing a shitty computer hacker dude and Ice T's coming to wait, me. Griffin, you're playing a hacker, a computer yeah, guy. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Which yes. wait, which episode is this? Because I've probably seen it. It's called Russian Brides. They're looking to get a trail of Russian mail order brides. And I play a guy who like hides computer trails for rich people. Uh, what year was this? 2012, I want to say. OK, I, I was I was still watching SVU at that. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it Why was, wouldn't you be? It was when Mariska went on maternity leave and they added two new detectives before she came back. Yeah, that was a. Not the greatest time for SVU, but <laughs> right. So it was it was like one of the first episodes of the new female detective character and Ice T, and the two of them are breaking into my thing and they're trying to get me to like hand over evidence so they can find the trail of the Russian brides or whatever. And uh Ice T's just like a fucking pro, right? He comes in, they hand him the sides, he cold reads them, he goes, like, let's do this. They have three cameras rolling, they get all his coverage, he does it in like one take, right? Maybe maybe two takes maximum, right? And they're just like, great, Ice, you're good. And he's like, great. And then they're like, let's turn around onto the kid. And they put all the cameras on me. And now, and I just have to imagine because this this was communicated. No one said anything to anyone. No one said anything to me. I just have to imagine this is how they do this. Any episode where he has to interrogate someone and someone has to be frightened by him. They turn all the cameras around to me. He's clean. He's not in the shot at all. You cannot see his mouth. So he knows that he can say whatever he wants and they call action in every other word out of his mouth is motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not exaggerating. You it's, have never told that story yeah, it's before. motherfucker. Get that motherfucking lollipop out of your motherfucking <laughs> mouth unless I fucking smack it out. And it, and it worked. Like, I was terrified. Not only because it's like he's saying that to me, but I'm also just like, is any of this usable? What is the, what's going on here? Like, I just right, look so right. flummoxed. And I remember the writer coming up to me afterwards and I was like, that was intense. And he was like, Ice-T just called you a motherfucker. <laughs> it's almost as good as being called a motherfucker by Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, like, he was like, almost. that's, that, that's <laughs> like saying you played with the Beach Boys or something. It's like the silver medal, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of being called a motherfucker yeah. on screen. Yeah. That is so funny. Do you think he just figured that out like in like season five? He was just like, oh yeah, that'll, that'll get a great reaction. I did ask him about it, but it was just such well-oiled machinery that it just felt like they were like, this scene's a six. And everyone (laughs) in the crew was like, six, got it, okay. (laughs) Like, it felt like that was his mode where he's just like... like It's like a catcher sending a sign to a picture. They're just like, blue, left. (laughs) Right, because no one was like, ice, wow, that was crazy. They were just like, okay, cut, (laughs) grit. (laughs) (laughs) And they knew to frame it so that you couldn't see his mouth. Like, they knew you have to get the other guy's coverage with ice totally out of frame because he's going to say motherfucker. Well, Ice-T is not in this movie. No, Ice-T is in this movie, movie. In this movie. And it makes him a movie star. Yeah. Uh, they And they will go on to be in Trespass together the next year. Mm-hmm. But um, Boys in the Hood, let's talk about some of, you know, yeah, there's that. I actually love the opening. I do too. Um, okay, so I'm not alone in this. Definitely. Um, I love it. Yeah. it's it, you, you need it. I feel like you absolutely need it. 
Well, yeah, right. Because right. if we were starting on them as essentially these kind of like, you know, confident teenagers, you might not. Right. There, there's that just sort of it's it's crucial. And and just that the, the confidence of some of these compositions in the start, like where like the kids walking down the street, the teacher is talking in voiceover saying like he's a really intelligent kid, but he's got a temper. I don't know where it's coming from. And the kids just like walking past someone get beat up. Like, yes, it's like Aisha, like you're saying, like everything in this movie is definitely very like stark and like, you know, kind of grabbing the audience's chin and pointing them at it. But like, it's very, very effective. I, I also think in terms of like, you know, movies teach you how to watch them, especially because this is a world that was not being shown in multiplexes at this point in time. The fact that you open with 30 minutes of them as children, there's a real framing of like, I'm I'm going to tell an epic story here, right? Like you've seen the poster. It's three teenagers, right? It's young men. But here we are and we're spending half an hour with them as little boys. I'm going to make you consider their entire lives. You know, yeah, this so, isn't just right. a slice. This isn't just the last week of school or something. I really want you to think of them holistically as people in their entire life up until that point. And and just the fact that that prologue uh, goes on for that long, you know, that, that you really have to live in their reality and also that you start seeing the circumstances of the world through their eyes when children are so much more guileless, you know, when they're moldable, when you're there's the immediate tension of how much are they going to get shaped by the things around them? Uh, you know, him him getting up in front of the class and, and just sort of immediately like talking rather than like freezing up and like, you know, saying like, well, my dad says like the first humans were found in Africa, like just all that. There's like a sort of like sweetness mixed with chip on shoulder. Like it's not, you know, like a, the bad version of this movie. I don't know. The, the teacher would just give a speech to the kid's face yeah. about how he's a fuck up or how he's never going to amount to anything like that's that's the bad version of this opening. David, uh, you're talking about the, the bad version of the opening, and I would like to talk about a bad version of a closing. And that is when you forget to eat before all the restaurants around you close. This is a thing that happens to me an embarrassing amount because I have no sense of time. I forget what time it is, and then I realize, oh, I need to uh, get dinner. And sometimes, all the places in your neighborhood uh, within walking distance, even if you live in a city, let alone if you live outside of a city, are closed. And that's why it's fun to use a service like Grubhub. Grubhub, a new sponsor on the show, preventing you from being outsmarted by those restaurants closing early if you're like me and you eat on a bad schedule. Because you can get deals on the food you love with Grubhub perks. Grubhub has all the food you love from your favorite local restaurants, okay? Here's an example for me, okay? Grubhub Perks, I've noticed, often offers very good deals on Taco Bell. Uh, you can get a lot of extra little bonus items or discounts if you uh, buy a certain amount. Different Taco Bell locations have different Grubhub deals. I've made good use of the Grubhub Perks for Taco Bell uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and there's no Taco Bell really within walking distance of me. So it's been a big uh, salve. I'll also say my internal organs are failing and now I need to get uh, my gallbladder surgically removed, uh, possibly from eating too much Taco Bell. So uh, Grubhub has helped me be able to get a uh, delivery and place pickup orders uh, for foods that are uh, more <sighs> in line with my current dietary needs. Uh, so yeah, you know, once again, uh, Grubhub perks can help you get a free, uh, you know, uh, Doritos Locos taco or help you get a free green tea on top of the steamed chicken and rice that you now eat every night. The point is just grub what you love. That's what I'm telling you to do here. Just grub what you love. You know, you take a break from cooking and boy, did I need a break from cooking to just order some food for my favorite restaurants. You get perks on all types of food, pizza, tacos, sushi, and more. You got a variety of options for all the picky eaters in your house. And there's no pickier eater in my house than downtown Griffey Nooms. Also, I live alone. Uh, try something new with Grubhub. You know, you check out local restaurants in your area. You could try a variety of cuisines. 
Cuisines is how that is said. Cuisines is how that is said. I'm so hungry that I can't even do this ad read properly. I need to order some Grubhub, okay? That's the point here. So you can order ahead and pick up your favorite food from your favorite restaurant to Grubhub if you're looking for a nice little walk, if you're looking for an excuse to get out of the house, but you don't want to spend too much time in a, in a store around other people, okay? So the point is, you get the food you love with perks from Grubhub. You can grub what you love. And I'm sorry if I got aggressive here, but I guess you could say I'm hangry and I need some Grubhub. Can, can I say, I think such an effective storytelling tool that is not used often enough is defining a character by how people talk about them before they come on screen. You know so much about Furious Styles from the speech that Trey gives as a boy and saying, my dad told me this. Yeah. You know, from the moment you meet the guy, you're just like, I understand who he is. Now I just want to see what he looks like and who's playing him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's the the great scene uh, right before he goes to Furious where Angela Bassett's character is on the phone and she's like, we're we're moving and she's he's going to go live with his dad. And the teacher's like his dad. And she's like, yes, he has a father. And it's like, Ugh, well, <laughs> I mean, part of it, part of the. I feel like some of the critiques of movies like this and the movies it's it spawned in its wake, you know, is that there can be a tendency to pathologize, to really kind of ham like hammer, hammer home, like, OK, this is a sort of um, this is a pathology. This is part of black culture for there not to be fathers and whatnot. But I think this movie really walks a fine line and does a good job of not tilting too much into that. Like, yes, this is true that really Furious is the only father figure in this movie. But at the same time, that gentrification speech really kind of helps create this community and this understanding that this is not of their doing per se. This is the way society, white society, white mainstream society has made it. They have abandoned our our um our neighborhoods this is why part of the reason why we were like this and so i think the it, he does such a good job of walking that very fine line in doing this having these scenes like the scene with the black cop who is <laughs> uh, you know so cruel and nasty to them which singleton says that's right out of his life yeah where right you, you always run the risk in movies like this of like this one scene is supposed to encapsulate an entire societal problem or decades of, you know, racist ideology. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a movie. It's very tough to boil things down or to get, you know, or to give things in appropriate way. Like, you know, to, to just be like, yeah, this is a stand in for everything. And there are, there are obviously scenes, you know, uh, where, where characters become more, uh, you know, polemic. Right. But I think one of the chief successes of this movie is, it feels like he constantly refocuses back on these characters are specific people. They are not archetypal. I'm telling the stories of these guys. You know, they don't represent everything, uh, even though their world is a microcosm of an issue that I'm very concerned about, a series of issues, you know? Well, I do think the the cop is the one sort of key flaw for me because... I kind of agree. They're just so... I don't know. I feel like to to me, the, the issues isn't so much that this cop exists in the film. It's the way in which he exists solely to like kind of spout the most like horrific things in ways that right. one Whereas the white cop stands there just sort of being like, OK. Right. You know. and, and, and it doesn't feel real to me. Like, why would this character be telling this to like, this is why I became a cop. Like, that just seems like something you wouldn't tell another person. <laughs> it is a wild thing to just say. <laughs> you know, yes. like, why? <laughs> but, you know, Singleton says it's out of his life. And that's the thing that often is true where they're like, well, that happened to me. I'm like, I believe you. Like, but it's so crazy that it's tough to put it in a movie. Sure. Yeah. But maybe it did actually happen. I just feel like I, and I, I'm certain that that person exists and, and probably still exists in some form. But I just felt like him telling like doing this like sort of sort of short monologue where he's like, I became a cop so that I can take 
all you black people off the street and blah, blah, blah. It was just like, eh, I don't know. That could have been said to the white cop. Like, I feel like it would be more realistic for him to be saying this to like someone else. Not right. Not to people <laughs> right, who just called a, a, in a burglary as well. They, it's not like they're like, anyway. Th- those two scenes are the shake the entire movie for me. And I think it's a combination of they feel incredibly overwritten, whether or not it is verbatim from his life. You still sometimes need to, as you said, write things down from reality because things feel more ridiculous, you know, especially when you put him into a fictionalized environment. I also think that performance is not particularly good. I think he is not helping. He's over cranking things a lot. He's got some some Uncle Ruckus going on there. It's, yes. like a, little, it's a, little too, <laughs> yeah. a little too much for me. Um, I, I think yeah. he's in a different movie. <laughs> His yeah. name is Jesse Lawrence Ferguson. The the Furious Styles character, though, I feel like does feel more believable, partly just because you can tell how much Singleton like that's like the, you know, such a fleshed out loved character, like how much Singleton's pouring his own, you know, dad into it and just the, the specifics of his speeches. And also, I guess dad's giving speeches is just like the oldest it's movie. Trope. Like I, I, I right. I, I, I'm pretty ready for, you know dad to talk to his son and be like look all right here's here's my perspective on wearing a condom or <laughs> joining the army or you know but also let's say like here's lawrence fishburne right who's like in his late 20s and has already been acting for almost 20 years right has like lived multiple lifetimes has like overcome drug addictions was like in the jungle with coppola and doing uh, lasso tricks with Pee Wee herman and just fucking everything and like Here's the part, essentially, he's been waiting for his entire career, right? Like, this is finally, someone has given him a bag large enough to hold everything he has to put into a character. And there's something about the fact that he has so much restraint in what he's doing. This would be such an easy character to overplay, you know? And he's, he's so quiet. He's so focused, you know? And there's just such a... Um, uh, I don't know, an integrity to him and to everything he's saying. It's so thought out. I mean, he said in this thing that when he read the script, he like sobbed and that it was just like the first time he read something where he was just like, I, I absolutely understand what this needs to be. And people joke about the fact that there's like, what, a five year age difference between him and Cuba in this. Yeah, we've got some Mamma Mia stuff going on here. <laughs> it's like, how are, how, are you, how are you playing? But that honestly, I feel like that happens all the time, especially with black with black actors. This this happens fairly frequently where it's like there's not that big of an age difference between the actual actors in part because, <laughs> well, white people have a hard time telling black <laughs> how, how old they are. It's like, I don't know. They, they, they don't know. That Angela Bassett is now 62. Like, yeah. they, they would probably see this movie and be like, I don't know, what is she, 45? This actually happens on Blackish, too. On Blackish, she's playing Anthony Anderson's uh, father. And I think there's maybe 10 years age difference between them. Could be even less. I'm, I'm going to look it up. Fishburne's 61. Ash and and if no, Fishburne is fifty. Born I'm saying born in sixty one. Yes, yes. Right, and Anthony Anderson was born in nineteen seventy. He's nine years older than him. Yeah. Look, <laughs> it's just that it's that Hollywood thing where they add five years to the older person, the the older character, and subtract five from the younger character. But then with black actors, I think they just they just do that a little more in either direction. Well, there's also just not the not as many. At least back then, there were not as many black actors that were being chosen. So it's like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like uh, so many of these movies uh, just have the most stacked casts and it's great, but it's also you're like, shit, people just wanted uh, roles that were interesting. Like it was just so hard to be a black actor in the 90s to have any role that might have some depth to it. When we did Love and Basketball last summer, we had that same thought. We were just like, it is bug nuts how just every actor who appears in one scene of this movie went on to become famous later, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and it, it is just that thing of like, if you write a movie that has 30 good parts in it for black actors, you will have no shortage of people who have been waiting for the opportunity, you know, uh, to actually play a real human being. I also just think Fishburne has such gravitas 
that you do sell that he is like infinitely more worldly than the rest of the cast. Absolutely. Uh, you know, everyone else has been acting for a couple years and he's been acting since he was a child. So you're just like, he is so much more comfortable on screen than everyone else in a way that you can't fake. Uh, and that gives him that sense of maturity. I also think it's just kind of smart that it's like, they cast more age appropriate for him at the beginning of the movie with young Trey, which in a way is more important than if you cast an older actor who would be too old in the opening scenes and age appropriate later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess Trey is supposed to be 17 when we jump, right? He's right. like, that's how old he is, right? He's like, and, and Cuba looks a little older than that. They all look a little older. <laughs> right. They all, they are. They, it, Morris just noticed, but like Morris is like, I'm going to college. And I'm like, Morris, it looks like you just left college and entered pro football. <laughs> like you, you, it looks like you just left grad school. Like, come on. <laughs> I mean, Cuba also is like that, that Mulaney joke where he has such a baby face. So he never really ages. He just looks like an increasingly tired child. <laughs> you know, right. like you can't yes. say he looks old in this movie, but you're also like, but you're just like, you're an exhausted looking 17 year old. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so we jump forward. I don't know. Is there anything else in the early scenes that we want to talk about? I mean, just we're talking about Lawrence Fisher, but that's that, that stone skipping scene is so fucking good. And also just at the beginning, there's sort of that like even before you get to the classroom, there's that flash of sort of like. Uh, when they're looking at the paintings and you hear them parroting back things they've heard on the news and they talk about why there's the, the, the yellow color of the blood because the plasma is separating. I mean, there's so much just from the sort of like the worldliness that these kids shouldn't have at this age, you know, the casualness with which they talk about stuff. Also, this movie just has one of the most arresting openings ever. Just in terms of like how immediately you're getting the cacophony of dialogue over the Columbia logo before the title even shows up. I love that. And then the gunshots. Yeah. 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 It's just like immediately throwing you into the world. Um, love that old Columbia logo, too. Great logo. I was, I was going to say the old gray lady, but that's not correct. No, that's the New York Times. <laughs> yeah. Can we call her the old beige lady? What's it, her robes okay. are cream. Cream. Yeah. Cream lady. Yeah. The old cream lady. <laughs> kind of a... Right. Yeah. I don't know. Taupe? <laughs> Miss, yeah. Miss Columbia, the old taupe lady? <laughs> uh, we jump forward. We're at a barbecue. Doughboy, uh, played by Ice Cube, has just gotten out of jail. Mm -hmm. He has new friends. Um, I do like how little Chris, we just never... It's never... Right? No one ever says why he's in a wheelchair. We just kind of... It's just Assume. implied, like, he's already been wounded, you know, by a, a gunshot wound. Like, and the, 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 the story Singleton tells is that that guy was like, that actor was just like, hey, you wrote a, a like, a, a movie with a guy in a wheelchair. Like, who, who that's me. Like, you got to put me in the movie. He just, like, literally accosted John Singleton, was like, you have to put me in. The Reg Green is his name. Wow. There's this scene with Neil Long and Regina King. Mm -hmm. I mean, this movie is not heavy on female characters uh getting a ton to do i would say no that's like basically the only movie where two women are talking to each other i trying to think of others yeah yeah and when angela bassett talks to the teacher which happens off screen in voiceover <laughs> yes um oh well i guess there's the mom uh the mom and his girlfriend. Oh, and, and Ricky's girlfriend. Ricky's yeah. girlfriend. Yeah, Ricky's mom and girlfriend. But like, again, it's like, it's about Ricky. <laughs> yeah, know? let's say, right. It fails the Bechdel test because every time two women are talking, they're talking about a man. Yes. Yeah. It's a lot of moms and girlfriends. That's yes. that's more the point I was trying. I do like Regina King's like two scenes in this movie. Like, I mean, Regina King is like throwing heat and this is her first movie. Regina King just... She never misses. Yeah. She had done what, like over 100 episodes of 227. That was her only credit. And then she said the show ended. No one would hire her. She couldn't get an audition. Like as far as she was concerned, she thought her career was over. And this was the thing that single handedly gave her a future. Uh, and so she shows up. She's ready. Like the Regina King it fucking never misses. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, but we I don't know. What do we think? This sort of middle kind of true part of the movie where it's just like they're young men growing up and like 
Cuba Gooding Jr. is figuring out sex and like, you know, like a tray. And- Lying about being a virgin <laughs> or not being a virgin. <laughs> Right. Making up an insane story where like, you know, a mom is chasing him. With a, a fucking, <laughs> what do you call it? The the hacked, hatchet. Hatchet. Or... There you go. Hatchet. <laughs> yes. I know. I know people always talk about drunk history, but the fucking Michael Pena bit in the Ant-Man movies is so lifted from this. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, oh, yeah. drunk hift- history is maybe the bridge between the two, but especially with the kind of like unreliable narrator aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, I also the the true folk comparison is interesting because I just I do love how much the midsection is just kind of like relatively conflict free, just a glimpse in these lives, you know, to a certain extent. I think this movie reminds me a lot to of um, uh, uh, best years of our lives, Hmm. um, which I one of my favorite movies ever. Um, But in the way that like that movie is about the shared trauma that these three guys have and then them reentering society and you sort of follow them separately and then they cross back over each other and the supporting characters come in and out and all that sort of stuff. This midsection is sort of just that, but it's more sort of the the all consuming threat of trauma around them at all times. But so much of it is just kind of this like quotidian day by day stuff. They're chilling out. They're going to parties. They're right. I mean, you know, Trey's trying to get laid. It's just nice seeing people live in a movie, you know? The fashion. That's always something that stuck out to me. I mean, it's like I love 90s fashion and there's so many different kinds of styles being represented. Like that's something that just like is major. I feel like we should point out. Absolutely. I mean, the Jerry curls, like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> i'll say like outside of the jerry curls pretty much the way everyone looks in this movie would be cool today right the jerry curls are the one thing that haven't maybe carried over to 2021 that's the one like oh it's the early 90s right i mean i guess like the the i don't know i feel like ice cube is the one his character is the one who's like kind of dated because it's like backy he wears just a lot of like t-shirts and Daggy things and he also has the worst jerry curl it's it's hard to yes. yeah yeah um yes he is uh, right he is sort of hilariously the dorkiest looking even though he's kind of supposed to be like the toughest most street savvy of the of all the characters whereas the rest of them are they look good i mean do you guys did i talk about how i think mars chestnut is hot I just, I, should yeah. I get on that? No, it's uh, yeah especially just because it's like He's so built too, you know? The, the mesh shirts. I, yeah. I love a mesh shirt. That's such a choice. I just love imagining <laughs> a world where I would feel okay wearing a mesh shirt where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to throw on the mesh shirt today. I think everyone's going to enjoy that. <laughs> but I also just like, I feel we were talking about this in some recent episode, how like wildly the standards have changed for what like a fit man is on screen and how now often I find them grotesque, you know? Like when I see someone who's gotten jacked for a, a Marvel movie, I'm just like, I would never want to look like that. I don't find that aspirational at all. And then you look at Morris Chestnut, and you're like, oh, no, no, that is how a person's supposed to look. That is actually, men take note, the ideal physical form. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm not getting there. I don't know if I can chestnut. Yeah, I'm more, I'm more, like, I'm more like Morris Peanut, you know? <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm small um, and I don't have a lot of muscle definition. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, I, the movie does kind of slow down here. It's not bad. I, I agree. I love it. The last it's, it's, half, yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah. But like, you know, you have like the college recruiter coming to talk about the SATs. You have the, the gentrification, the furious, furious lecture about gentrification. You just have a lot of little like interludes like this. Obviously, the, the sex fantasy scene, uh, down to the, the thing you're talking about in terms of drunk history, Griffin is like, when he's like, and then she said, do you know how to drive? You know, like, and she's saying the word hey, that that and, just... and him doing voiceover for his own performance, you know, <laughs> where it's like. But this is the John Husey thing as well. Like, and, you know, uh, all, all that just sort of the like that he's mixing in this kind of like lighter teen dramedy stuff. And that you can do slice of life stuff that it doesn't have to be all burdened with uh, conflict. Um, although at the same time, he's 
laying the groundwork for the conflict that comes at the end because you know right. when they you go, have ferris yeah yeah when when they go to that hangout on the boulevard or the street with everyone that's where they encounter the guy who they bump into and then the guns go off and it's terrifying uh it is terrifying but i guess it's like like menace to society that movie is so raw and Depressing. Like tough to watch and depressing. It's incredibly depressing. And it's sort of starting by kind of punching you in the face. Like, whereas this, like, yes, it's 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 in the air that, you know, I mean, there's the scene obviously where Furious that, that's earlier, but where Furious like, you know, conf- shoots through the door to confront the burglar and all that. Like, you know, it's not like they they're all just like living in, you know, happy teen lives that are gonna get disrupted later. Like, but it's just it's not as kind of agit proppy like it, it, i i kind of admire that it it's it's sort of swerves into this um teen melodrama territory That's it's it. it's also just a very like classical confidently made movie like you talk about a lot of young filmmakers who get to make a studio feature early right what made them break through the pack at such a young age is that they have like a very flashy kinetic style that they direct with a lot of energy i mean usually when you see a movie directed by someone who is under 25 you're like oh yeah that's a movie directed by a 22 year old right it's just like it's all like come on let me at him let me at him (laughs) and this is like there's this right i want to do every move i've ever thought of in film school every camera move right yeah right 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 the camera is going to go through a guy's out eyeball and out his ear and whatever and like this this is a weirdly relaxed movie in terms of you don't get the sense that he feels like he has something to prove, you know, even though he obviously did. It doesn't feel like it is a movie that is working too hard to impress you. It is a movie that feels like it is very confident in what it has to say and that it will land. Um, I mean, it, they they talked about it in this feature, too, but like everyone was just kind of very protective of him, I think, because he was so young, especially like. Fishburne and Bassett, who are older, but Stephanie Allen as well. And everyone was just kind of like, we need to make sure this guy isn't fucked with. You know, Mm -hmm. I think the whole cast kind of insulated him from studio meddling and whatever to just say, like, give him the space. He needs to succeed on his own terms here. It's the only way it's going to work. He has some story about like they shot the first scene. He was like, great, print it. And then they moved to the second scene. And he says that again, and like his AD takes him aside and is like, you can do as many takes as you like, you know, like, and he was just like, right, I'm not in film school anymore. I can like, <laughs> I, I'm, it's not every foot of film counts. Yeah. Like, uh, so he's learning as he goes, which makes this movie all the more astonishing because it does not really feel like that. It pretty, you know, feels like a movie that's from a veteran Hollywood person in a good way. It's so depressing to me in a certain way where like you, you know, so many of the uh, directors we've covered on this show, especially people whose careers start in the, the 80s or the 90s, you know, and get to make their first movie young. Like when Cameron Crowe is doing Say Anything, there's the story. The, I think the first scene they shot is when Cusack is putting on the videotape at the uh, old folks home and is giving them like the speech beforehand. And they did like one take. And Cameron Crowe said, like, print onto the next set. And, like, the AD had to pull him aside and be like, you need to shoot coverage. You need to put, like, the camera in two places so there are editing options. And he didn't even think of that. And I just feel like there's something kind of beautiful to whether it's through lack of experience or lack of confidence or whatever. Like, first time filmmakers be given that space to fail and gently be sort of, like, guided versus now where it's like, your first movie costs $200 million. It's on rails. <laughs> if you're wrong, the first AD will overpower you and yell over you. You know, the executive will come in and demand that you have to do these 20 things. You know, I think what we're talking about is that now, uh, you know, studio filmmaking, especially with first time filmmakers, is so micromanaged by executives and by the studios that it has become uh something of a ritual but that's a bad ritual they're not letting people experiment and try different things to figure out who they are a good ritual for example is a multivitamin company that you know and trust that's what a good ritual is okay and let me tell you something else about 
ritual. Protein powders can feel intimidating. It says in here, quote, no pain, no gain, end quote. I guess the, the implication is protein powders seem like a thing for buff dudes, for those who are cut and swole and star in Michael Bay films. Uh, you know, and their formulas can be opaque, not just because they're powdered. That's a little joke. That's a funny little joke here in the ad copy. But the truth is deep down, as in on cellular level deep, we all need protein and it's about more than just muscles. So our team of scientists, hello, Harvard. That's once again, something they put in their ad copy. Reimagine protein from the ground up and inside out from how it's made to who it's for and why it's needed. The result is a delicious plant-based protein offered in three premium formulations for distinct life stages and unique nutrient needs, all made with the same high standard approach and commitment to traceability that Ritual is known for. Whether you're doing reps, not me, or more into dog walks, prospectively me once I get my stuff together enough to get a dog, I'm proud, I am proud and honored to introduce a central protein from Ritual here to shake things up. I'll say the fine folks at Ritual sent me a big old bag of this powder and they sent me uh, like a, a bottle as well. Like, it, I, I don't know what to call it. It's like a water bottle. It's like a shaker water bottle. And as I uh, said in a previous ad read, my internal organs are starting to uh, fail me and I'm trying to adjust my diet and live healthier and, uh, you know, still trying to make sure that I get all the essential nutrients I need while eating a very, very uh, limited diet so as to try to manage uh, uh, my gallstones. Uh, so uh, th this protein shake has really helped me out. It's been good. It has helped me stay balanced. I like it. It is easy to make. You don't need a blender. It's a big old silver bag of powder and you put some scoops into some water and you shake it up just with your hand and it's fun and it tastes good. And as Nick Weiger would say, vanilla is a flavor. OK, and this is what it's about. It's about supporting daily health for tomorrow as much as today. Made with nutrients to support bones and brains and muscles and help maintain muscle mass as you age, which, boy, that's certainly a priority for me. It's, it's clean plant-based formula specifically created to support nutrient needs of different life stages, such as 18 plus pregnancy and postpartum. 50 plus, maybe add a new category that is just Griffin body uh, for when you're uh, Griffin Newman and your body just starts collapsing. Uh, it's got 20 G's of pea protein plus a complete amino acid profile made with essential choline, choline. I'll just take two bites of that apple and hope that one of them's correct, which helps to fill common dietary gaps. This delicious handcrafted vanilla flavor made from a direct-from-farmer vanilla bean extract, sustainably harvested in Madagascar. So why not shake up your ritual? And that's a joke because you shake the powder into the water and that makes the shake. To make something new, less scary, Ritual is offering a money-back guarantee if you're not 100% in love. Not even in like, in love. So... 100%, no risk, money back guarantee. And on top of that, my listeners could get 10% off during their first three months. Here's all you got to do. You just got to visit ritual.com slash blank check to add some essential protein to your life today. That is ritual.com slash blank check. What's... Next, I guess it's Ricky dying. I can't, yeah, it's not a long movie. It feels very epic. It's an hour and 50 minutes. When I was putting it on, I was like, what is this movie? Like two hours, 20 minutes long? Because I just think of it as this like big, muscular, like life story movie. But it's, I guess it's just, we just meet Ferris and the, the bloods like, you know, shooting the gun in the air. Like that's really it, right? Like there's just been that one confrontation. And that's that's kind of that, right? Like, well, that and then the cop when he pulls him when he pulls him over, and then like other than that, the the big thing is just like 
am I going to lose my virginity? Am I going to pass the a- SATs? Like Ch- Chestnut's just like so comfortable on screen. You know, there's such a like gentleness to him where it's not like he's a character who has these big emotional scenes, but you're just rooting for this guy so thoroughly. You know, he's just like such an innately sympathetic performer. And when he, you see him watching the army commercial on TV, you just get like this like lump in your throat. You're just like, oh, fuck. I just know. I know what he's thinking while he sees this. You know, before you even get to the scene where Cuba tries to talk him out of it, you're just like, I understand why this is appealing to this guy. I understand why this guy feels trapped. You know, you're worried about that outcome for him for long enough that you're you lose track of the bigger threat around the corner, you know? Yeah. And it's just just the way Doughboy react like just that's what I love about Ice Cube's performance. It's just when when you just sort of see it cross his face like, oh, 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 I know what's about to happen, you know. And it's not like Trey running and screaming. Like he just has this sort of like resigned horror as he's like, okay, we gotta go. Trey has like the operatic reaction. And when when Doughboy pulls up in the car and he sees the body lying there, he shakes his head. That's what I love. They don't cut to a close up or whatever. He doesn't cry. He doesn't scream. When he gets closer, he gets more emotional. But his first reaction is like, oh, oh, I had a feeling this would happen, you know, which I think speaks to the energy of the movie, which is this air of resignation. These guys have of just like it could happen. And when he gets his revenge, it's not satisfying for the audience, really, certainly not for him. And like his, you know, driver is essentially like, what are you doing? You're getting out of the car? Like, that's not like that, that's 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 too much. Yeah, you're putting a hat on a hat here. You know, like he he can't even believe that Doughboy is like whatever, like trying to, you know, linger at the crime scene. Well, also, there's that quiet tension when Trey starts asking for them to let him out of the car. And Doughboy is just not even responding. And it's because like Trey saying, let me out of the car is is rubbing in Doughboy's face. I shouldn't be doing this in the first place. We should all abandon ship right now. This is a bad idea to let him out of the car is to acknowledge that there's a thing that should be prevented. Well, on top of that, <clears throat> you have the fact that prior to this, they've set it up that like Doughboy is the problem child and Ricky is the is the golden boy. And, oh, man, the scene where they bring his body back every time I start crying because just the screen that the punctured screams of the mother and his girlfriend. And then when she's like the way in which I forget the actress's name, but she plays that scene so fantastically. Uh, what? Um, what is her uh, the actress playing the mother, um, Ricky's Ricky's mother. Yeah. Um, Fuck, what is her name? Uh, It's Tyra Farrell. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. So Tyra Farrell, she plays that role because she's got conflicting emotions. She's going in and out between I'm grieving. And then she she starts smacking him and she's like, you did this. You did this. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness, I can't take how just like visceral this feeling is. You can just see all the emotions going back and forth between her and when we see him later on be like, okay, now I got to go take revenge. It's like, you feel as though it's, it's partially, yes, it's kind of in his, not his nature, but this is like what he would do anyway, because he, he is the one out of the three of them who flirts with the, the, the gang lifestyle, but it's also, well, he clearly harbors some guilt or like some resentment and feelings about the relationship he had with his brother. And, and, and that's driving him just as much as, you know, the fact that he carries a gun and, you know, is, is ready to, to pop off at, at, at any moment or at least give the impression that he's going to pop up at any moment. Well, it's also just like murder. Murdering Ricky is so meaningless. You know, it's it's like the feeling in this movie that like this community puts their chips on this guy. Right. That when the college scouts show up, they're like, well, of course, Ricky. Yes. Ricky's on a different track than the rest of us. And they all go stand outside. They sit outside so that they can talk in the in the room when the college recruiter comes. They're like, oh, OK, yeah, we got to go outside. We'll hang out here. Yeah. There's just like that that respect there for for Ricky. Right. And so for everyone else, they're just like, this is just so cruel and senseless. What a tragedy. 
And and Doughboy, as you said, is the one guy who sort of flirts with like being on this game board, you know? And yeah. he's conflicted about like, well, the rules of war are I'm supposed to retaliate. Right. Um, I, I just think it's also like it's such a masterstroke for me that when the the scene where they drive up to the bloods uh outside the burger place, uh the way you enter that scene is just with those three or four guys talking bullshit, you know, that it's the same kind of conversations we heard in the middle act of the movie. You know, they're talking about getting a haircut and they're talking about girls and stuff. And that's before Doughboy shows up, before the car is even in frame. It's this very important sort of narrative framing of this movie could have just as easily been about these four guys. Yeah. You know, and, and and as much of the movie would have been light and fun. These guys are not like, uh, you know, uh, career criminals. They're they're victims of the exact same circumstances. But the bad version of this movie is uh, Trey is like Doughboy, like we can't continue this cycle of violence, like don't even bother. But if, if I much right, Trey's just like, I let me out of this. Like, I know this is not a good idea. But it's not like he's like trying to talk them out of what you're saying. The whole sort of like, you know, well, well now we have to respond like the whole thing that's going on. Because Trey himself is a kid, right? Like it would make sense for Furious to, to make that speech. But for for Trey, like, yes, he's a good boy, but he's also <laughs> but he's still, you know, he's he's a kid. He's not going to moralize in that way, in the same way or at all in the way that Furious would. And it's also so much about being a teenager and when you're you're so self-conscious about how you want to be perceived, what kind of person you want to be. You know, you are playing roles in some kind of way, trying to form yourself into the adult you think you'll hopefully get to turn into. You know, you're you're play acting the part before you own it. Um, you know, and that's like it's it's so much the root of like the the tragedy of this movie is just like, well, the stakes are so high for these guys. but they it shouldn't be they're 17 these are wanton decisions by hormonal children you know like in so many ways that's right that's why them as kids and them as horny teenagers in the middle of the movie that's it's brilliant i think it's it's it, yeah and just the matter of factness of the movie i don't know i think this movie almost gets a bad rap for being too much the you know stanley kramery you know movie that taught hollywood about life in South Central LA because that's how Hollywood reacted to it. And obviously, you know, it's not like the movie isn't trying to deliver a pointed message, but like, I do think Singleton is also just like, here's my slice of life movie. And Hollywood is like, well, he said it. <laughs> All right. We have no more work to do. Look at that. Wow. And we even gave him an Oscar nomination. You know, it's the other movie I was weirdly thinking of a lot while watching this. Cause I feel like there's a similar phenomenon at play in terms of its reputation uh uh in terms of endearment when we watched it for this podcast and i was so astonished to remember like oh right only the last 20 minutes are this devastating weepy cancer drama up until uh, that right. point the movie is just the life of this woman and it is sort of similar to the second act of this movie where it's like seeing her go from different marriages different relationships different eras of her life the tragedy of that movie is you get so invested in her as a real person that when this tragic thing happens, it feels so unfair because it doesn't feel like the whole movie's been pushing her towards that inevitable outcome. And it's the same thing with like Ricky in this movie, you know, it, you you get so comfortable with these characters and their lives and you're rooting for them that when, you know, the the epic tragedy happens, it, it hits so much harder, but much like terms of endearment where the reputation is just oh my god i cry so much that movie's so sad it's so depressing i think this movie can get flattened out to ricky running to doughboy fading away to a couple of the furious speeches i mean you can take like four the four most iconic moments of this movie and it feels a lot more polemic than it is you know when so much of it is kind of slice of life and that's the only stuff that stuff is the only reason why the bigger scenes work. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Good movie. Good movie. The ending is very good. I like I like an, you know, uh, just uh, it's sort of like. Uh, I mean, it's even more 
uh, brutal, but just the, the, it's like American graffiti where yeah. it's just like titles are just like, yeah. So, you know, as just FYI, you know, Doughboy isn't going to make it out through the month. Yeah. Just two weeks later. We should, we should say iconic. I mean, scenes, the ending with ice cube drinking a 40 pouring it out. It's so good. You don't know. They don't show. Don't care about what happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's so well written. Like, that's the best version of what we're talking about. You know, where because it really it feels, feels like, like something he would say, like versus like. a right. Yes, it, it's from the mouth of the character. It doesn't feel like the writer trying to make some argument. It's really grounded in it. And there's something so uh, sad about the sort of soberness with which he sees the whole situation in that moment. Yeah. And it's also it's 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 a sort of I don't know if it's subtle, but you can miss it if you're not thinking about it in this way. And it's also just sort of an indictment on the media and, again, on the way in which racism leads to these consequences. Like, yes, he was shot by another Black person. And, you know, at the beginning of the movie, there's that title card where he's like, uh, I can't remember the exact, but it says like a certain amount of Black men will not live very long. And then often they are shot by other Black people, which, like, when we talk about black and black crime, that can be a little dicey. Um, but to have it at the end be like, well, no one cares that this is happening. It, it's like it, it kind of balances it out. And I think just really and it ties in the the um, sort of the Vietnam because Fierce is a Vietnam vet. And mm -hmm. that's and, and to tie in. He says at the end, Ice Cube is like, well, I saw all this stuff happening, terrible stuff happening abroad. but nothing about what's happening here and i just think it's a nice little kind of like bow at the end of it um it, it's also like if, if at times the movie veers a little bit into like singleton pointing his finger at the audience and saying like this is important you need to listen it's because of this final speech like this is sort of like the thesis statement of the movie which is these lives are not considered you know there there are people like ricky getting shot every day and they're just listed as statistics to perpetuate fear mongering in the media. Mm -hmm. And and we don't consider their lives. They're not discussed. They're not reported on. You know, they're just cited as uh, rising crime rates. And you have those titles at the beginning that are sort of, you know, warning you. Like, here's a movie. You're going to see four young men. And two of them will be dead by the end of this movie. Right. I mean, that's what it's really telling you. Like, you're, you're going to watch this. You don't think of it that literally, I think, at the beginning of the movie. You view it more as place setting. But that's really the story he's telling. It could be any one of these four kids. It could be two of these four kids, you know? Um, yeah. And the final speech is like, you know, Ice-T, excuse me, Ice Cube, you know, in character Jesus. delivering something. If it was Ice-T, it would just be motherfucker every other word, which I don't think would be as impactful. But you have you have Doughboy saying to the audience essentially why this film needs to exist in the first place, because otherwise th these stories aren't being told. And then they would get told many, many times after this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hollywood's like, make that movie again. I mean, that's that's the story of Hollywood is yeah. when something like this comes out that's sort of surprising and makes waves for that very reason and demonstrates that there's an audience for this kind of movie. Hollywood's reaction is like, great. We should make this movie 20 times. <laughs> that should be the only kind of movie we make in this whole genre. But we should talk. I mean, Griffin, we've done the box office for this. Do you know why? 1991. Well, July 12th, 1991. What, what is it? Ben? Wait. Sorry. All right. Really quick, because we didn't mention this, but their, their friends' names. Mm. Dookie and Monster. You like Dookie Monster. Dookie and Monster are great nicknames for like your friends. You know what I mean? I don't know. I just like I really wanted to shout that out. No, it's a great nickname. But I, I, I while I was watching it this time around, I, I was actually trying to figure out what are their names? Because I feel like they just come and go really quickly. And they say Chris's name a couple of times. But um, and then Monster wears I think he wears a hat at one point that says Monster on it, which I guess tells us which one he is. But I, they He's are got a custom names. hat. I mean, that's <laughs> that's cool. That's a cool look. It, Dookie is the one, yeah, with the pacifier. I just, I he he just confidently has the pacifier. Oh no, Dookie died. Oh really? 
No, in real life. Yeah, he, he, he died like literally three years later. He was only 22. He was shot like during a fight. It's, it's brutal. There's another, um, you know, the guy who plays the trigger man for the murder, uh, Lloyd Avery, he like died in prison after like uh, committing a, a murder. Like there, there's, you know, there's some sort of sad stories in the like, you know, if you go deep into the cast list for this movie. Yeah. Dookie just does the first three Singleton movies. He does Boys in the Hood, Poetic Justice, Higher Learning mm-hmm. and then dies. Oh, wow. Because Singleton, like, it, again, describes casting that guy where it's just like, he came in, he had the the pacifier. I was just like, this is fucking hilarious. Like this guy rules. <laughs> and like, and th- th- that is credited. It's like the whole, in the nineties. Like I remember I had a friend who had a pacifier that she would like wear around her neck. It was just like a thing in the nineties, I guess. Well, it was like rave culture too kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was definitely rave. Yeah. Then it becomes <laughs> an apparatus. Then it becomes means to an end, right? It's a, <laughs> it's a distribution system. <laughs> well, you can use it. Sure. Yeah. One other thing I noticed, so watching it again this time, I was looking at the the younger version of Ricky. I was like, why does he look like Eddie from Family Matters? But it can't be Eddie because this is 1991 and Eddie would have been already like a teen, like much older than that. And then I realized it's his brother. Like, that's the guy Whoa. who played Eddie. Yeah. Donovan McCrary is uh, the brother of Darius McCrary, who played Eddie on Family Matters. They look so much alike. It was crazy. They do. And he he's in in a couple episodes of Family Matters after this movie. Yeah, I saw that, too. I was like, oh, that's <laughs> so, so weird. Right. And that's pretty much all he does. I mean, that there's yeah, that's that's his entire career. Um, Nia Long, I mean, we didn't really shot. I mean, she doesn't have a ton to do in this movie. She's another one where this is her first movie. Basically, she'd been in like one horror movie in a tiny role before this. I, I want to I was going to uh, circle back to her uh, because I also I one of the big scenes I think we didn't discuss. I, I think the scene where they sleep together is really, really good, especially because that midsection has been built around a lot of virginity panic for Trey. <laughs> that scene is so like tender. Well, even his own dad thoughtful. is like, have you gotten any? Right, <laughs> right. S- That's like hassling. Sniffing him. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. the fact that it comes after, out of Trey crying, right? And then saying, I never thought I'd cry in front of a female. And even just the way it's shot versus a lot of sex scenes of the 90s, you know? And even like the fake fantasy sex scene we've seen already in the movie. I just think it's a really good scene, but also your entry point into that is that moment where uh, Neil Long is doing her homework in front of the computer and then she hears the gunshots and just sort of like flinches and then goes back to work, you know? Yeah. And it's such beautiful, uh, like tragic world building. We should also just mention the the sound design is such a huge part of this movie. I mean, like w- when they, you know, let the score swell, when they drop out the score entirely, when you're just getting the echoes of be they sirens or helicopters or shots in the background, it just gives it like such a sense of environment, a constant sort of reminder of of the the dangers around them at all times. And then there's that saxophone, the (laughs) 80s, 90s saxophone that was in every (laughs) serious movie. (laughs) Throw it in there. Absolutely. (laughs) Like we need a jazz musician. I mean, that's probably another think spike lee is inadvertently turning into a trend by like you know bringing in his jazz musician dad to score his movies and then like just like having the it's stanley clark did the score for this movie and he's like a big jazz fusion guy it's definitely right yeah it's that thing i mean there's like a natural evolution to how these things develop and then the wayne brothers get in there and people are like oh it's a genre (laughs) you can't do these things anymore damn the wayne brothers yeah I remember liking that movie a lot, but it's also funny that I probably saw Don't Be a Menace before I saw Boys in the Hood. Yeah, that's that's not the best way to <laughs> the wrong order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the wrong order. But that is how that is. I mean, I mean, and they had already done I'm going to get you, sucker, which right. is like a parody of black exploitation. Like, and they're just like in the 90s. They're like, OK, let's, you know, w- w- what's the trend now? You know, yeah. in in uh, I mean, the, I'm going to get you, sucker, is Keenan Ivory Wins, but still. Obviously. I, the dynasty. Uh, I always think about uh, Mike Lawrence, the comedian, has a bit about how he saw Spaceballs years before he saw Star Wars. So when he finally saw Star Wars, he was like, this is just unfunny Spaceballs. <laughs> <laughs> where where are all the jokes? This movie sucks. I've seen this before. The guy was made out of pizza. It was better. 
<laughs> uh, so this movie came out July 12th, 1991, Griffin. Okay. It's the same weekend as Point Break. That is why we have done this box office before. I doubt you remember it, but it is the same weekend as Point Break. Was that now was this the first wide weekend? Because it opened limited in L.A. before it went nationwide, right? It, well, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this as like a semi-wide weekend. It's like 800 theaters, though. Like it, it's a pretty serious. I think there was like a smaller release, but I was trying to get the dates on it. I mean, the, the big thing with this movie too is that it was sort of like. Oh, I guess I'm seeing July 2nd. That might just be the premiere, though. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't know. know. What were you uh, saying? Sorry. No, that Columbia sort of uh, viewed this movie as a flyer back when studios didn't have specialty divisions, and they were like, "We can make a small movie with an unknown cast, and who knows." Um, but then the fact that it got into Khan, it played on certain regard, um, but made such a big splash there and uh, it was received so well there, it kind of gave Columbia the confidence of like, oh, this might be a major movie if people are liking it in Europe, you know, like they thought it was going to be a hyper specific uh, film. And then it turned out to be a lot more universal than they believed. So by the time it opened in the States a couple months later, it had this sort of uh, buzz around it, not only for like generationally, like, you know, kids of this age, but also just like the, the hoi polloi were like, well, this movie just burned up the quasit. It's opening over a point break, which I would think, uh, you know, you'd think of as point break as ostensibly the more commercial movie. That's the big action movie. It has a big star in Swayze. It's got two big and stars. And an up and coming yeah. star in Keanu. Yeah. Well, Keanu is sort of like a new star. No, I meant Gary but, Busey. Swayze and BOC. Yeah. <laughs> Swayze and BOC, yeah. Um, but what's number one at the box office, Griffin? It's an action movie. It's a, it's the biggest movie of the year. We've talked about it on this podcast. It's Terminator 2 Judgment Day, right? That's right, which came out the week before. So we've, this. you know how we somehow like cluster our podcast, like sort of identify certain times in popular culture because we keep doing movies from right. So the summer of 91 was a hot summer. There was some shit happening there. It's also just crazy to think that, like, here are three major directors who all have, if not their single most defining film, one one of their most towering triumphs, all like at the same time in theaters that you could see like Catherine Bigelow, James Cameron and John Singleton all punching at like their highest. Definitely. Definitely. And number two, Griffin, it's an it's a Disney re-release. Can you remember? That's number two. 1991 Disney re-release. It's not The Jungle Book, is it? No. Oh, is it um, 101 Dalmatians? Yes, it is. 101 Dalmatians making $10 million over Boys in the Hood and Point Break. Aisha, we've both been doing the, um, uh, the trivia spotting things for film spotting. We have. Uh, David did it once and dominated and then left, uh, retired early, Nichols and May style. I, I just don't know if I can return after, yeah, completely blowing the doors off. Yeah. Did, I, yeah, well, last week, I, I, uh, not last week, last month I came in dead last. So I, you probably had the better strategy, David. Um, but, uh, one of the ones, uh, that we were both on Aisha, um, Josh and Adam were asking everyone to go around all the, the team captains. So like, what's the first movie you remember seeing in theaters? Almost everyone's answer was a Disney film re-released. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, it is just one of those things where it's like, if your you, parents were like, okay. But, but also it's like, if you were born before 1995, that was such a formative part of your childhood was probably the first movie you saw in theater was a movie that your parents saw in theaters that was being re-released for the first time in six years. And everyone went around, almost everyone had that answer of like, for me, it was the eighth release of Cinderella. It was the 1990 release of Jungle Book, you know? I think I was the only one who said a new movie. <laughs> and, and I, Which I was? I, I think it was Beauty and the Beast. And we, I remember, well, I don't really remember seeing it, but I've been told that we saw it in... Uh, like Thanksgiving weekend of 1991. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you were there. You were small. I'm assuming I was you were three. a young person. I was eight. <laughs> very small. <laughs> because the first movie I saw in theaters, I am told, is a was a re-release of John Huston's Annie. Wow. You know, like a special screening of that. And I have no memory of that. But apparently uh, that's the first thing I saw in a theater. I saw Jungle Book and I remember it and you say I'm a liar. But I think I, do say I think lot, that's yes. another part of it, Aisha, is that like by 1991, 92, 93, 
Disney's releasing new movies that are like, like there was that gulf there, like kind of post Jungle Book Robin Hood, right? Where the 80s, the late 70s were dark for Disney. So it was just like, oh, you were probably seeing a, an earlier, better Disney movie in theaters blowing up the box office rather than your first movie being the Black Cauldron. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they haven't even re-released -re Black Cauldron on in theaters. I would be surprised if they have. I, I am all but certain they never re-released it in theaters because I remember being such a Disney nerd as a kid. And when they took it out of the vault and put it on VHS in like the mid 90s, I was like, what the fuck is this thing? <laughs> it's so No dark. one's ever talked about this. <laughs> but I was just like, this isn't on the posters. They never play clips of this. It's not in the sing along videos for for good reason. I'm sorry, all the Black Cauldron fans, but but, but it's just <laughs> it, it's the erasure of it. It's just kind of incredible how Disney was just like, we we don't talk about that. That's that's the troubled member of the family. It's like that in Song of the South. You're like, <laughs> but I, but here's the thing that's insane. They hide Black Cauldron more than Song of the South. True, because you, you got the South is, Yeah, it's at the yeah. fucking theme songs. They put it on the sing along <laughs> videos. Black Cauldron. They're just like, look, it, it was look. It, it just got caught up with the wrong crowds. Well, did they have music? I don't. I I haven't seen it in years. But so that's part of the issue, right? Like you can't isolate the music out of it. You know. Yeah, but I just genuinely, when it came out in VHS, I was like, is this new? Yeah, I feel like Black Cauldron is like the sort of the stone of the 80s. It's like, we don't really talk about this movie. Um, okay, wait, so, so it's Terminator 2 is number one. Boys in the Hood's number two. Point Break is number three. No, 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 no. Terminator 2, number one. 101 Dalmatians, number oh, two. Oh, sorry. Boys in the Hood, number three, opening to $10 million. It's going to make... Uh, 56 domestic and no money internationally, basically, which is going, I'm sure, to be a that's going to be a story of his 90s movies because, yeah, it, there's just no effort to sell like movies with black leads to the rest of the world, especially in the 90s. Like, you know, it's fucking insane. There, there was just, uh, I mean, a self perpetuating narrative that just it, they do not travel, and even like the biggest black stars in America. Will Smith was often credited as like the first one who actually crossed over that Denzel movies and Eddie Murphy movies, you know, that they wouldn't do as well in other countries. But it also felt like the studios wouldn't even try. And to some degree, it was only Black Panther when now distributors are starting to go like, oh, maybe we could have just released these movies everywhere all along. Yeah. Well, I mean, with Will Smith, he the, the thing about him was that he was he's he still has not worked with a black director ever. Uh, is that like never in his entire career? Not for, not for film. That's crazy. No. Uh, so, but like Denzel was hopping in, he was working with really Tony Scott and, and Spike. Like he, I mean, most, I, I actually can't think of any black actor besides Will Smith who has never worked with a black director. Like it's impossible to be a black director or black actor. Uh, at least before. The uh, King Richard movie, the one that he's shooting now is Ronaldo Marcus Green. But so that's that will the first. be that's his first. That is <laughs> and wild Night, to think and about. And M. Night Shyamalan, yeah. I think, is the only non-white director he's worked with. Well, oh, and there's and Ang, Lee. Ang Lee. Yeah. We can't forget about Gemini Man. Uh, can but we? yes, can, can that, is, that is that is. <laughs> but no, it does. <laughs> how dare it does speak to that. And also, like, you know, Will Smith has had relatively few black. Uh, romantic interests in films. I mean, to some degree, it feels like Will Smith was running his career like a politician. Oh, absolutely. You know, like Tom Cruise style going like, how do I make myself seem bankable to overseas distributors? Oh, absolutely. It's very calculated. Yeah, yeah, right. Because, wait, I, I who directed Bad Boys for Life? That's, are they, they're from like, they're like Moroccan, Belgian Moroccan directors, right? Uh, the, uh, they... Uh, Adil and Bilal. Yes. Anyway, that's the, the, he just now. The exceptions are all in the last eight years. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> last five years. Like, yeah, just he just anyway. That is crazy. Um, Number five of the box office, Griffin. It's a comedy sequel. It's a comedy sequel. Uh, uh How recently was the first movie? Well, that's a good question. Because I feel like they're comedy sequels where they're like, let's get this thing out nine months later. And they're comedy sequels where they're like, we waited eight years. We made a mistake. I feel like I know this one. Maybe. Please. Always guess. It's three years later. Is it? From the first Look one. Look Who's Talking 2 or 3? 
It is not look who's talking to, which okay. is that is the ultimate example of they were like, let's make the sequel now. Like, like the day it came out, they were like, rush this thing out. Or honey, honey, I, honey, I shrunk the or I blew up the baby kid. <laughs> blew up the baby kid. Yes, honey, I blew up the baby kid. Is that the correct answer? No, no, it's not. Okay. Honey, I blew up the baby I, kid. I, I think I know to, what it is. I just wanted. To, what is it? I and I uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but Aisha, I feel like those two guesses set me up thinking al- along the right lines. Is it Three Men and a Little Lady? It's not God Three Men it. and a Little Lady, a film I have seen. No, you guys are guessing in the. Fa- I just wanted to. I just want to just make this clear. Look who's talking came out October 1989. Look who's talking to came out December 1990. 14 months. Yeah. If you had two babies in that time span, it would be surprising. Yeah. They made two. That's how, just so fast. But isn't Wayne's World like that? Wayne's World is December 93 for two. And the first one. Uh, Wayne's World is February 1992 for the first one. Wait, now that you say that, is it Bill and Ted? It's not Bill and Ted, although that comes out. Uh, I want to look it up. Uh, the next week, Bogus Journey comes out. Okay. So you're you're in the right ballpark. Historic time. Um, just and Wayne's World three is December. So Wayne's World, yeah, it's like less than two years. Yeah. No, come on. Um, it's a, all right. It's a spoofy movie. It's a, uh, more it's clues. A spoofy. Oh, is it Hot Shots Part Two? No. Fuck. <laughs> you, this is now fun. What? We're guessing. Here's the other thing. What a golden age for Hollywood. Hollywood just making <laughs> bullshit comedies like that we like. 19, on cable. 1991. 1991. It's been three years. Okay. I'm going to tell you, it's also not Problem Child 2, which is number nine at the box office. Wow. Oh, God. That's another one where I feel like that Problem Child 2 came out one week after Problem Child 1. <laughs> <laughs> it came out 11 months after Problem Thank Child you. 1. That's how fast. <laughs> right. That is so fast. It's like that Pink Panther movie they made after Peter Sellers died where they just took all the leftover pieces and had a guy be like, we right. can't find him anywhere. They shot like 30 <laughs> minutes of new footage where they're like, this guy's missing. Problem Child 2 is just bloopers. Uh, come on, come on. Okay, they, fuck. Uh, come on. 91, three years later, so it's a, an 87 original, 88 original, sorry, I'm bad at math. Uh, I only understand math when it's uh, box office numbers. Uh, okay, 88 sequel. It's spoofy. There will be a third and final film three years later. Oh, 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 oh. I'm going to be really upset with myself if this is correct and I didn't guess it immediately. Is it Naked Gun 2 and a Half the Smell of Fear? That's right. It's one of the best comedies ever made. Funny move. The best one, right? In my, in my opinion, yes. The best of the three. That's the one. Is, was OJ in that one or was it the other one? Oh, OJ's in all three. Oh, he's in all three. Oh, yeah, okay. and the third, <laughs> the third one came out after the murder. He's in all three. <laughs> But the, it does have my favorite of the OJ gangs, which is when when the USC marching band marches over him, <laughs> yeah. when he keeps like he gets like hit by a bus and then a steamroller. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's the one. It's the one with the queen. It's the one with Queen Elizabeth. No, it's not. That's the first one, isn't it? That's the first one, right? Yes. No, you're right. That's the first one that has the marching band. Yeah, that's right. Wait, it's the one with the Oscars, or is that no the Oscars is third one. The second one is Richard yes. Griffiths. <laughs> Yes, the mistaken the identity. And right. So the first one's Ricardo Montalban. Is Goulet two or three? Goulet is two. Yeah, see, every couple of years I watch all three just because I want to be able to remember which one is which. And then by the end of the year, it's faded and I combine them all into one movie. But I do know that two is the funniest. It's Naked Gun two and a half. The other okay. movies of the top 10. You've got Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Mm. You've got Regarding Henry with mm. Harry Ford himself. Uh, you got City Slickers, Ben. Yeah. I feel like that's a Ben movie. Oh, hell yeah. Problem Child 2. And The Rocketeer. Underrated Disney classic, The Rocketeer, which we will do on this podcast one day. Uh, I, this is just a thing I've become increasingly obsessed with. Uh, I feel like we've, I've made you do in recent episodes. But just looking at a top 10 of like 90s, which is just like peak movie star, where every single one of those movies is like, oh, that's a blank movie, pretty much. Right? Like not Problem Child. And 101 Dalmatians is a Disney movie, but it's like, you know, what? It's a Arnie, Schwarzenegger movie. Swayze. It's a Swayze movie. Right. Leslie Nielsen. Yes. <laughs> uh, Costner, Harrison Ford, Billy Crystal, 
And then Billy Campbell, of course. Well, that's the other weird thing it represents is when Disney was like, I don't know, we can't make any franchises work. Should we do a 30s superhero who has a jetpack? Yeah. We'll just we'll never stop being the most fascinating misunderstanding of a trend when Batman was successful and everyone was like, I think it's the 30s thing that everyone liked. <laughs> right, everyone <laughs> likes the throwback. And it's just five of radio them. Drama. It's just fucking Shadow and Rocketeer and Phantom, and they're like, no, I think one of these 30s movies is gonna work. <laughs> Aisha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Boys, um, what, what, what did we decide on? Pods. Pods, pods in, in the cast. cast. Pods in the cast. Pods, pods, pods in the cast. Pods in the cast. Yeah. yeah. Um, what a what a what a huge start to a career and what a what a great uh, guest to start off our, our mini series with. It's gonna be a good mini. I think it's gonna be a good mini. Yeah. It's always just so nice too after covering like a gargantuan career like uh uh fucking Zemeckis to have have a couple that we can like some smaller things yeah that don't take yeah. you know an, an entire life cycle of, of some animals to get through um i should people should listen to pop culture happy hour if they don't already which is stupid to even plug it on this show because it's you're constantly the number one podcast on uh, on the tv and movie charts that we uh, obsessively look at yeah, we are. We are. It's a great team. I, I recently joined after having been a fan for years and it's it's been great. And listen, if you're not listening, you should listen. We're five days a week now. A, a franchise. Yeah, we are kind of. Kind, yeah, we're a franchise. franchise. Yeah, you're a franchise. <laughs> um, and thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review and subscribe. Thank you to. Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media. Thank you to our editing team, Alex Barron and AJ McKeon. Thank you to Lee Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song. Go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to our Shopify page for some real nerdy shirts and other pieces of merchandise. But the thing doesn't work as well if I say a different word other than shirts because the joke is that shirts and shit sound kind of similar yeah of course thank you um tune in uh you could go to patreon.com slash blank check uh, yeah that's true yeah for blank check uh special feature i don't know what we're doing at this point because we banked up episodes very far in advance so at this point it's a mystery uh maybe we're doing whatever one march madness probably that's that's what it's gonna be yeah right so, so uh, excited for go that. to patreon where i assume we're doing commentaries on the rugrats trilogy Problem child, probably. Or, yeah, oh, rag, rag, rag. We were both rushing to such <laughs> similar jokes, Ben. <laughs> I mean, and, and the difference between those two jokes tells you everything about the difference between the two of us as human beings. We got a rugrat and a problem child. That's who are my, my, co, my co-hosts are. Rugrats all day. Rugrats all day. <laughs> Thank you. Baby's got to do what a baby's got to do. Uh... Man, David, you've been watching Mary Tyler Moore show recently. I've been I've been telling you to get into it. It's a good show. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, I have seen Mary Tyler I, Moore before. Much I just have like never... with Cheers, I had recommended to you that it is a good solve for anxiety during these troubled times. So you have been rewatching Mary Tyler Moore in complete. Have you ever watched it, Aisha? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I, I just watched a Mary Tyler Moore episode a week ago. Just turned it on. Yeah, guess. it's it's a great it's a great show. I've never watched it from like beginning to end, but it was on like at night all the time, you know, so I highly recommend giving it a, a, a solid run through on Hulu. Uh, I just finished the seventh season. But David, there is an episode, I think, in the second or third season in which uh, the voice actor for Stu Pickles appears. And I, I couldn't understand why I, my my neck was tingling. You were like, huh, who <laughs> yeah. is this? That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Oh, my God. Stu Pickles hot. Right. Recognizably <laughs> the same voice. Uh, anyway, uh, that's the final plug of the episode. Please watch the Mary Tyler Moore show on Hulu. <laughs> uh, everyone involved in the show has died since I started watching it, and I find it very depressing and eerie, but it's a great thing no, to watch. Ed, Ed Asner is still kicking. He just got his vaccine shot a couple of days ago. Fingers crossed. Ed Ed can never die. I will lose it if, if Ed slips off this mortal coil. Griffin, he, he is 91 years old. I wouldn't push all your chips in on I'm Ed Asner. I'm pushing all can never die. my chips <laughs> okay. in on okay. Ed Asner. We're, we're rooting for you, bro. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I love him. Tune in next week for Poetic Justice. And as always, I want to just say it one more time on the record. 
Ed Asner will never <laughs> die. Stop. No. Don't do that. Okay. All right. Please. <laughs> when is this episode coming out? <laughs> So it's like Billy Crystal is this guy from the city, but he's in <laughs> uh-huh. like a desert setting and he yeah. doesn't fit in, you know, yeah. and there's this <laughs> grouchy the guy West. who do, they don't get along, you know, they don't get along. It's, at all. It, I mean, God, what a what a premise. <laughs>